number 10, veil. Through this video, you will come to find out that a lot of the wedding traditions that we practice these days have some pretty messed up origins. We'll get through a lot of them throughout this list, but let's start off by talking about the bride's veil. These days, a lot of brides choose to wear a veil on their wedding day. With so many different styles to choose from, this accessory is known to add that extra little pizzazz, little spice to the look. But throughout history, veils were used for different things, some of them being a tad bit messed up. Just a smidge. The rather obvious reason for brides to wear a veil back in the day had to do with religion and staying modest. But this hasn't been the only reason for veils. In ancient Rome, brides wore veils because it was believed to be effective at warding off evil spirits. The most messed up reason for the veil though, at least in my opinion anyway, has to do with the wedding transaction, so to speak. Since back in the olden days, marrying your daughter off was seen as more of a transaction, brides would wear veils to cover their faces and they wouldn't be lifted until after they were proclaimed husband and wife so that the groom wouldn't be able to back out if he didn't like how his bride looked. Seems pretty messed up to me, but what are your thoughts on it? Tell us down in the comments. Number 9. When Doves Cry I've been to one wedding where they released doves, like actual real life doves, and I was like, do they actually do this? I couldn't believe my eyes. I didn't know it was a real thing. Why do we do this? Well, because doves mate for life, and they build a nest, and then they Netflix and chill until the end of their dove days. Sounds like perfect symbolism if I've ever heard it. Back in ancient Roman and Greek times, doves were often used as gifts from the bride to the groom. Pretty shitty gift if you ask me. Here's a bird that we now have to both take care of. The snow white ring neck dove is used by magicians. They can't fly too well. They don't have a homing instinct. Whereas rock doves, the ones commonly used in weddings that we see fly away over Nana's head, they have a homing instinct for hundreds of miles. So they're perfect for the gig. But they couldn't be released during foul weather and they needed two hours before the sun sets in order for them to fly home. The wedding band has less rules than the doves. That's amazing. They're riders much smaller. If you were to catch one of these doves at a wedding, you were also allowed to keep it back in the day. Also, great hands. I don't know who's catching birds or why they want to keep it and put it in their pocket, but you do you. At number eight, best man. These days, the role of the best man normally goes to the guy who's closest to the groom, whether that's a brother or a best friend. But back during the time where women were married off like property, the role of the best man was very different and was all about protecting one's assets. Back then, bride napping was actually very common, so if there was someone else who wanted to marry someone who was already promised to another person, they might try and steal her away for themselves. Yeah, why? I don't know. This is where the best man came in. The best man's job was to protect the bride and if she was stolen, the best man would be the one to enter whatever battle or duel was necessary to get the bride back. The best man was literally there to be the best fighter. The best man was also there to watch over the bride to make sure that she didn't try and make a run for it herself. They really said, try to derail this wedding and see what happens. Number seven, a June wedding. As we're counting down this list slowly but surely, you've probably begun Begun fantasizing maybe about your own wedding one day. Maybe it's a beach wedding, maybe it's themed like a winter wonderland. Doesn't that sound cozy? It's your big day, get creative. They say the best month to get married is June, and from a Canadian point of view, I can absolutely agree with that. In ancient Roman times, however, getting married in June was a must, not just a thing you wanted to do. See, June was the month of the god Juno. They protect women in life when it comes to marriage and childbirth, so if it's between that and like, I don't know, Halloween, obviously we're gonna go with June, better omens for sure. Another myth is that bathing was rarely done back then, so when majority of the population did finally you know, wash up. At the end of May or beginning of June, that's often when it would happen. Everybody smelled nice, they felt good, and they wanted to celebrate. So it was perfect timing. Better get me while my pits smell good, you know? That's a myth, but I can also see it checking out. A June wedding in ancient Roman days was also done so that after a spring birth, the mother can quickly hop back into action and help with that summer's harvest. Maternity leave who? Never heard of her. At number six, hashtag twinning. You know how at weddings the bridesmaids are usually wearing matching outfits? Well, this tradition dates back centuries, though it has changed slightly over the years. Remember how I mentioned that people would sometimes try to kidnap the bride on her wedding day? Well, 
Meanwhile, other than the best man and the groomsmen trying to play their part in protecting the bride from being taken, the bridesmaids also played a part in that too. The bridesmaids used to dress identically to the bride so that it would make it harder to spot her and therefore prevent anyone from kidnapping her. This practice dates all the way back to ancient Rome and feudal China and didn't really start to fade out of tradition until around the 1880s. These days, you get a couple of gifts from the bride for being in her posse, but back then, you didn't get anything and you had to risk your safety for your girl Becky who doesn't even want to marry Jeff down the block. I don't know. In our number five spot today, we have donations. In the dark ages, it wouldn't necessarily be strange to either donate or sell your own urine. Yeah, the market was hot for urine because they used it a bunch during this time in history. Medieval chamber pots would collect all of the stuff from an entire household or public space wherever they were placed. And oftentimes they could later be sold at the local tanner or fuller in town. I mean, talk about an easy way to make some money, but how horrible. The reason this product was so popular is because it was used in a variety variety of ways. It could be used to clean clothing, to help with the dyeing process, to tan leather hides, and like I spoke about in a recent video, be used to help in the cotton making process in order to make the material soft and not frayed. While the practical uses make the wholesale process a little less peculiar, it honestly still would just be weird to have to sell your own pee or your neighbor's pee. Number four, color coordinated. I get it, on Wednesdays we wear pink. It's nice to add a little color into your schedule at work in the office. It's fun, sure, have at it. In medieval times, they were serious about their looks and colors. There was no fun around back then. Having rules about what colors and what type of clothing and hats you could wear, you named it. It was all based on your occupation or social level. Some colors were banned for certain professions. Imagine that. For example, imagine if you were a night worker, right? If I can say that, a woman lady of the night. You weren't allowed to wear certain styles or colors. That's hilarious. Hey, welcome to Ontario. We don't wear jeans here. Got it? All right, now get in. 15th century English law banned knights or anybody below knights from wearing velvet, which is so random to me and so funny looking back. Now imagine that. And you may know this one, but purple was a fancy color back then. Purple has been associated with royalty even since the ancient world. Natural purple dye was rare, and medieval Europeans believed that mixing dyes was unnatural and diabolic. It was a no-no. So they were missing out on purple for quite a while because they didn't want to, you know, mixed goods, if I can say that. In our number three spot today, we have divorce by combat. If you talk to most people who are divorced nowadays, they'll tell you about how awful the divorce proceedings can be. It's expensive, it's time consuming, and sometimes things get pretty heated. While these harrowing tales are definitely less than delightful, things could definitely be worse. And by worse, I mean you could be getting a divorce in the dark ages by way of combat. The first documented instance of this was created by Hans Talhofer in a 1467 name manuscript. He wrote, quote, as per the instructions, the husband was put up to his waist in a three foot wide hole dug in the ground with one hand tied behind his back. The woman was to be armed with three rocks, each weighing between one and five pounds and each one wrapped in cloth. Basically, the man couldn't leave the hole, but the woman could run around the edge of the pit. He continued on, quote, if the man touched the edge of the pit with either his hand or arm, he had to surrender one of his clubs to the judges. If the woman hit him with a rock while he was was doing so, she forfeited one of her stones. While this sounds like an insane process, it really was true and continued on before growing rare in the early 13th century. Not only has the discovery of this historical practice shed light on something we previously did not know, but it also gives us a glimpse into the gender dynamics of the time period. We're not entirely sure how this sort of divorce ended, but many speculate that this basically continued on until one of them died or one of them surrendered. Number two, bucket family style. For my last one, today we're getting real cozy, real cozy. Remember in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory when all his grandparents have to share that one rickety old bed? Well, that's what everybody at home looked like in the dark ages. Imagine being in the middle, I'm already anxious thinking about it, just stuck. I mean, think about it though, back then space was so limited, warmth is also a plus in those winter nights, and beds, they were massive, they were made of straw and wood, it was a whole thing, it was a whole situation, it's not like you could fit more than one of these in your home, no way Jose. Even in the royal household, this was a common theme. King King Richard I of England and King Philip II of France both had to sleep in the same bed as an act of diplomacy. Again, I would be so anxious and awkward there. I'd be like, oh, excuse me, Mr. King guy, you're snoring too loud. In our number one spot today, we have affairs of the court. If you know anything about marriage in the Dark Ages, you know that love was often not a part of it. To sort of piggyback off my last point, if you were in a loveless marriage like most everyone else was in the time, but didn't want to go through the process of beating your spouse to a pulp or any of the other 
popular divorce methods at the time, you could instead turn to courtly love. This wasn't for the common household and instead was for members of the court, but it allowed the lords and ladies of the time to experience love and courtship despite what their marital status might be. Yeah. It was a place for married people to go and hook up. Well, not entirely. I mean, there of course were roles in place and society was very pious, so people weren't exactly hooking up. But it was a huge hit. People danced, they giggled, they flirted, and sometimes people could even be caught holding hands. One of the rules of courtly love just stated, marriage is no real excuse for not loving. Number 10, Naughty Naughty. There's a reason we don't do things like we did in ye olde times. We didn't know, but now we do. So there's really no excuse for acting up. A very common practice for marriage back in ye olde times was to marry a girl at the age of 12. And in case you're wondering, no, the man was nowhere close to the same age. Yes, it's just as gross as you think. No, I'm not happy talking about it, but that's just the way things went. I can just imagine how happy those young ladies were when their parents came to them and said, listen, the Lord across town fancies you and the dude's got the bag. So you're gonna marry him so mommy and daddy can get the bag too. That's just one example of the medieval business transaction. I mean, marriage. Marriage, marrying for love. <laughs> Number nine, pull up a chair. The people of my generation either struggle to phone the doctor to make an appointment because of crippling anxiety, or they flaunt it on OnlyFans. There's no in between. However, I still think most people would feel uncomfortable finalizing their marriage in front of a party of witnesses. I honestly cannot think of a more awkward situation. Do you cheer them on? Are, are there sports commentators talking about the moves? Are there snacks? You could be there for 30 seconds, or 10 minutes depending on who you're watching. It just seems like a lot of unpleasant viewing to walk out of a room later to then all agree that yes, yes indeed, that couple is married now. But hey, that's just how it went. Witnesses or family would watch you do what animals do on the Discovery Channel. Number eight, the birth factory. Soap and sanitation is one of the greatest things ever invented. Don't you just love taking a hot shower after a long day? Oh, I know I do. Hygiene was not the greatest back then, and while not the only factor, it did contribute to a high infant mortality rate. It was just one of the many factors. So when young women were married, and married rather quickly, it was time to start pumping babies out. It's more of a quantity over quality kind of thing. Before marriage was declared a holy sacrament, these things were happening everywhere. Pubs, town squares, heck, even in your house. Now, for the people at home, can you tell me how you feel about the holy sanctity of marriage? Especially if you've been married for more than 10 years. Does it feel good? I bet it does. Number seven, wrapped up. One of the weirdest superstitions and traditions that still carries on today is that the bride cannot be seen by the groom before she walks down the aisle at the wedding. Why? Well, it's bad luck. After all, that could ruin a marriage. Not like any other factors would have a hand in that. Like in-laws from hell are spending way too much money on the wedding, putting you in crippling debt right as you're just about to start your life together, right? Well, this was the way of the medieval wedding, and something used to even keep things mysterious was for the bride to wear a veil. It was thought that it would protect her from evil spirits, but also keep her from being seen by the groom, which honestly sounds like it might have been worse. So when the groom got to unwrap his wife, if he didn't like it, well, sucks to suck, brother. Just imagine your bride walking down the aisle and then... Yes, I will get married to you. Let's do it. Number six, Mr. Steal Yo Girl. This one's pretty messed up. I'm not even sure how this was even possible, but hey, here we go. So on your wedding night, it was the legal right of feudal lords to come on down to your place and shack up with your soon-to-be wife. What? Who most likely was a virgin? That's right, the government would come down and fornicate with your wife. Sound just like the IRS. Anyway, this messed up tradition is somewhat shrouded in curiosity due to its extremely uncomfortable nature and its legitimacy. It may or may not have happened, or at least if it did, it might not have been as commonplace as some people may think. Moving forward, I think it's safe to say that this tradition can stay in the past, as there's no need for the mayor of my town to be sweet talking to my wife during the wedding. Hey, hey Mr. Mayor, you get your hands off of her. I number five, an eye for an eye. When it came to the legal process in medieval Europe, things weren't always fair. I mean, they tried women for being witches and prosecuted animals for various crimes. Their punishments were sometimes swift and just, and other times, they weren't. 
People back then believed that when found guilty of a crime, there were worse punishments than losing a hand or something. As I mentioned a little earlier, they were quite fond of public humiliation, but they also believed in issuing fines and even kicking someone out of the community altogether. If someone was found guilty of a violent crime, then they would be subjected to punishment that would cause them pain as well, but not to teach them a lesson, but rather to brandish them so that they would be recognized as a person in the community who did that one thing to that one person, you know? Since these people were very religious, they also had to make up with God for whatever crime they committed as well, so usually that would involve fasting and then it would be up to Sky Daddy to determine if further punishment was needed. At number 4, The King's Evil being a king or queen in the Dark Ages might seem like a pretty cool job, but I don't really think it was. With the rivalries these people had, they were at risk of being assassinated in one way or another, they had to worry about their bloodlines, and of course, the thing that everyone had to deal with, illness. Some kings, to help out their people, were tasked with healing an illness called the king's evil. And you're probably wondering, well, these kings weren't doctors, how did they cure illness? And to that, I say, well, they touched it, of course. This whole thing started in the 11th century when Edward the Confessor became known for touching a person suffering from scrofula, aka the king's evil, and they cured them. People thought that this was a miracle and so for hundreds of years after that, English and French monarchs were tasked with touching the sick to cure them of this illness because the monarchs were believed to be an incarnation of the divine. At number 3, Tooth Worms. If you're one of those people who really hate going to the dentist, just be glad that you didn't have to go to the dentist during the Dark Ages because that was an absolute nightmare and a half. Not only do they not have any proper medication or anesthetics, but you could also get the worst diagnosis your dentist could ever give you, and that was a diagnosis of an infection of tooth worms. They believed that people could be infected with tooth worms that caused a tooth to decay and that pits and holes in the tooth were home to a worm that looked like a tiny eel. What's worse than the diagnosis, however, is the removal process. They didn't want to pull out the tooth that was supposedly infected with these tiny worms, so instead they used a more holistic approach. A method that they would use to rid the worm would be to take a candle made out of sheep's fat and various seeds, and then they would hold it as close to the tooth as possible so that the worm would run from the heat and fall into a little dish of water that was being held beneath the patient's mouth. That sounds like a horrible trip to the dentist, that's for sure. At number two, judging tears. In modern times, somehow we've come up with this idea that only girls are allowed to cry. I think that's pretty BS and it's healthy for everyone to express their emotions, and funnily enough, they believed the same thing back in the dark ages. Back then, everyone was expected to cry freely, but the strange part of all this is the fact that people judged how others cried. Their tears would be judged on quantity, duration of crying, and frequency as well. They took their tears pretty seriously. Obviously, when someone was crying because of some kind of loss, it was pretty much nothing, but if they saw someone else crying for a different or unexplained reason, this was believed to have been a different kind of tears called the gift of tears. They believed that this was a sign that someone was thinking of Jesus and his suffering, and that they were so overcome with emotion that they were moved to tears, and this was also considered a gift from God. As long as someone's crying wasn't too loud, they didn't cry too much, and it didn't disturb anyone, especially during a church service, they were just considered particularly devout. And finally, at number one, pee readings. This dark age tradition is probably one of the strangest ones I have ever heard, and you might come to think the same thing. In medieval England, people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. They took this method of diagnosis so seriously that they published books for the wealthy so that they could do the practice at home, and these books included illustrations and color charts so that they could judge their own pee. According to their text, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color and that meant everything was working properly. If it was wine colored, like blue or black, then that meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now, I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were since medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. Number 10, starting off strong with animal court. That's right, in the Middle Ages, apparently, it was a regular thing that animals would be put on trial. It was believed that animals who committed a crime were possessed by the devil. Of course they were, of course. And to let them go unpunished would give the devil the permission to take over human affairs. 
You don't want that. So they would be put on trial. Everything from hogs, beetles, rats, mice, cockerels, all have a history of being put on trial. In the 14th century, local people even prosecuted Spanish flies. Spanish flies were dangerous to livestock and would ruin vegetation, so needless to say, they weren't well liked. And they were appointed a lawyer, what kind of lawyer back then? No idea. And given great dignity in court, though the verdict was not favorable. They were condemned and banished from a plot of land. How exactly they enforced this? Who knows? An anywhere wedding, number nine. Apparently, back in the Middle Ages, shotgun weddings were like the thing. It was the to-do. One must simply exchange a sincere vow for another, or not even sincere. It could be like, you wanna get married? Yeah, cool, awesome. And two people could be married. Considering the hot blood of the youth, this could happen anywhere, even after they had already done the deed. Therefore, keeping track of who was married to who got pretty confusing. So then the church finally decided to make marriage a holy sacrament which must be observed by God but not only God the families had to make sure the ceremony was official all the way to the wedding night very often the bride would be carried to the marriage bed by the family who would then stay to view the consummation of the union that's right the tickly boo the boo boo the jiggy that yeah that's right your parents your in-laws would wait until they saw you get jiggy with it. Number eight, the dancing plague. Not as much of a tradition, but an event that almost became one. When I first learned about the dancing plague, I was speechless and hopefully you will be too. Keep in mind the Middle Ages weren't colorless, but there were some pretty bleak times. Doctors debate whether this event was caused by bacteria in rye that can cause hallucinations like LSD, but no one can really be sure. It just kind of happened and it's well documented. All people know is that in Strasbourg in July of 1518, a woman named Frau Trafia started dancing in the street and by the end of the week 40 people joined in and by the end of the month 400 people joined in. It was nuts. It was like a massive never-ending rave. Initially, physicians thought folks were just stressed out, so they even brought in professional dancers and musicians to like encourage the joyousness, but then people started dying from heart attacks and fatigue. So by that point, they were like, oh, we better cut this off. And so they whisked everyone off to uh, the mountaintop to pray, and apparently that prayed the dancing away. Number seven, men's fashion. I may be making a big statement here, but considering men's fashion has been variations of the tux for over two centuries now, kind of, eh, that's a stretch. This may be one of, if not the most colorful periods of men's fashion. Men got pretty risky when with their attire, like you're kind of impressed. Anglo-Saxon men wore tunics, trousers, leggings, and strappy leather shoes tied together with belts and girdles. Doesn't sound too crazy yet, but wait. Cod pieces were in and tunics got shorter so they could see their front manhood. Also, very long shoes were a big thing. Uh, the longer the shoes, the richer you appeared and the more pronounced the cod piece. Well, I think you... I think you get the picture. Men who wore pointier shoes had a higher social position. Some shoes were so long that they had to be reinforced with whalebone. They also adorned wide brim hats, felt caps, and hoods to protect their eyes during extreme weather. Number six, sexy and hairless. Women, on the other hand, had some even stranger qualifiers for beauty. Uh, while today having a thick and bold soap brow and a full head of hair is the ideal, it was the exact opposite for women in the Middle Ages. We have literally almost tried tried everything and I fear what happens next like women's fashion we just we've done a lot of stuff anyways in the Middle Ages a woman's forehead was considered the sexiest part of their face why no idea maybe because her breath was so bad it was better to kiss her forehead who knows but either way it was a big deal so what women used to do to draw attention to it was pluck their eyebrows hairline and ashes away to make sure it highlighted that part of their face. So at very often they would just have no eyelashes, no eyebrows, and like their hair would be like this far back. And number five, weddings. Marriage and weddings back in the Dark Ages were very different than they are today. Back then, because the average life expectancy was so low, people started getting married and having kids very young. Usually, girls would be married off as soon as they hit puberty, around the age of 12, and these marriages were not for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or for alliances. 
Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriages just weren't as big of a deal back then as they are today, it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. Most people didn't need permission to get married, so they could hold the ceremony anywhere. Marriage ceremonies were held in places like pubs, in the middle of the street, or even in bed. Because of this, it made it really hard to know who was really married and to whom until the 12th century when it was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. To make things even weirder, the consummation of marriage was also pretty odd because it wasn't a private affair. The act of bedding wasn't seen as an intimate moment between the couple, but rather an investment in the union, so it was observed by witnesses. I am certainly glad things have changed. At number 4, Jesters. You would think that being a court jester in the Dark Ages would have been a pretty bleak job, but you would actually be wrong. I mean, yeah, they looked funny with their outfits and hats modeled after the ears of a donkey, but jesters actually held a lot of power in court, making their job a pretty good one compared to other common folk. The court jester's job was to make people laugh by doing tricks, stunts, and telling jokes. Sometimes a jester would poke fun at the king or lord that they served, or would make comments about a kingdom's politics, and for a lot of people, saying these types of things would give them a one-way ticket to the gallows, but not the jester. Because of their profession, by royal decree, anything that they said was taken as a jest or a joke, so no one could get mad or offended at what the jester said or comments on. Basically, the jester was the one person in the court who was immune from medieval cancel culture. They could offend anyone they wanted to, and no one could stop them. At number 3, Unicorns and Jesus. The thing about the Dark Ages is that it was full of superstition and mythology. Within this period of time, there was a lot of confusion when it came to religion as paganism and the rise of Christianity were both hot topics. Many times, superstitions and mythology from paganism made its way into the religious beliefs of Christians and things were known to get a little weird. Take for example the unicorn and how it was incorporated into the Christian beliefs of the Dark Ages. It is believed that a mistranslation of what is thought to have been an ox is what brought unicorns into Christianity. Because of this mistranslation, the Bible likened Jesus to a unicorn. Since it was in religious texts, people in the Dark Ages sort of just ran with it, and so they started incorporating the unicorn into many religious artworks. To further this whole unicorn thing, they made up a superstition that only innocent maidens were allowed to touch unicorns, and they even used the unicorn to come up with a rather uncomfortable allegory of Christ entering Mary's womb. This unicorn thing was also fueled by the Vikings at one point. Point, as during the medieval age, Vikings were known to con people into buying narwhal tusks marketed as real unicorn horns. At number 2, Divorce by Combat. Back in the Dark Ages, if you wanted a divorce, you had to be willing to fight for it. Literally. In medieval Germany, couples would take to the ring to settle their disputes, and it was quite the showdown. Trial by combat was the common way of settling arguments back then, but when a husband and wife were fighting, things were a little more interesting than just having an all out brawl. During these divorce by combat proceedings, the husband had to stand in a hole with his hands behind his back, while the wife ran around in a circle with a bag full of rocks. I don't really see how this settled anything, but who am I to question the methods of the Dark Ages? And finally, at number one, Animal Court. I think that one of the weirdest things about life in the Middle Ages was their legal cases. As I just told you, their divorce proceedings were literally a trial by combat. They also found bizarre ways of trying someone if they were accused of witchcraft as well, and that was pretty dark, but the strangest court battles involved animals. Yes, animals were sometimes put on trial back in the Dark Ages. All animals from livestock to pets and even insects were not safe from the law and they would be put on trial if they were suspected of breaking the law. According to records from the Dark Ages, at least 85 animals were put on trial for a number of reasons. Pigs were the ones who were put on trial most often for chewing off people's body parts and even eating children. In 1474, a rooster was put on trial and found guilty of the unnatural crime of laying an egg, and even unwanted rats were put on trial and received strongly worded letters demanding that they leave the premises. The most bizarre case though involved a donkey who went through a legal trial and actually won. This donkey became the victim of unwanted advances, but was deemed innocent because someone declared her to be quote, virtuous and well-behaved animal, end quote. These people had 
way too much time on their hands. Number 10, carrying a sword. Whenever we see in medieval shows or hear stories or see art, everybody always has a sword at their side. I'll admit on one hand, literally, it's pretty badass. Was this really that common though in the 12th century? Was everyone gifted a sword on their 16th birthday like in Zelda Wind Waker? No, no, of course not. I mean, if you were traveling, sure, ideally you'd want a little dagger or a little something to help you out, but swords were a symbol of wealth and status. And the bigger and shinier the tune, the better, right? On average, these things would cost you seven months worth of wages. So you best start saving up and training. Yeah, you might want to train as well because these things were not light. No, not at all. Ideally, medieval swords would weigh three to four pounds. Doesn't sound like much at first, but I know after eight minutes, I would be switching arms real quick. It's like when you hold your hand up in class, you're like, oh God, what's going on here? Gotta do some push-ups. In our number nine spot today, we have the death cage. If you were to take a look at the punishments used in history, it quickly becomes clear that people of the past just really liked watching people die or have pain inflicted upon them. It's very strange, it's very dark, and it certainly is not for the faint of heart. The death cage is just one of the many horrifying punishments used during the dark ages. Essentially, this was just one method of execution that was extremely public as they would strip the person down and lock them in an iron cage that was placed Placed somewhere that everyone would be able to see. From here, the condemned person would be locked in there with no food or water, and everyone would just watch as they slowly died. Unbelievably messed up for a multitude of reasons, for sure. Sometimes, to make matters even worse, however, the condemned person would also be slathered in milk and honey, so that they would also be attracting insects, just to make the whole dying process even worse. It's all bad. I'm just thankful that those days are over. Number eight, the summer of 13. 48, AKA the Black Death. Now let's talk about this horrible event, shall we? If you thought summer 2020 sucked, well, buckle up, this one was pretty bad too. The bubonic plague traveled, the bubonic plague arrived to medieval England in 1348 and the death toll here was absolutely devastating. Somewhere from one third to half of England's population gone, just like that, and that's it. The plague hit hard and it hit fast. Now today we have variations of the virus, the one we shall not name, but back then the plague was a bacterium now known as Yersinia pestis. Now symptoms were quite jarring. You got lumps in the groin or your armpits, so that can't be comfortable. And next, the infected would notice black spots appearing all over their body. Almost all that were infected died within three days. More often than not, without a fever, so you wouldn't see it coming, aside from the black spots and the things I just said. Now, the drop in the population resulted in a widespread of wealth. Workers were demanding higher wages, and farmers were demanding lower rents. The poor got expandable income, so it kind of kind of helped, kind of didn't. I don't know. I don't know how to explain that. The Black Death spread more than a mile per day, and it's all thanks to traders and travelers. Yeah, humans can't stay still for a bit. We love traveling, even through the Black Death. Because, you know, why not? Roads are empty. As long as there aren't any rats hiding on board, maybe you'll make it. In our number seven spot, today we have the meowing nuns. Mass hysteria wasn't necessarily uncommon in the dark ages. There are a few instances we could discuss, but for today I want to talk about one of my favorites. In the book, The Epidemics of the Middle Ages, which was written by J.F. Hecker in 1844, there was the description of a very strange case of mass hysteria that broke out among nuns in a French convent in the Middle Ages. Basically, one day a nun in this French convent started to meow like a cat. I'm not sure why, I'm not sure how this started, all I know is that it happened. And you know what else happened? Other nuns in the convent began to also meow like cats. Eventually, it became such a thing that all of the nuns in the convent would meow together for a certain period of time. And of course, everyone surrounding this area was like, what in the absolute heck is going on right now? This is actually a huge problem because in these times, cats were hated. People associated cats with the devil and with disease. So a bunch of meowing nuns was like the equivalent of doomsday. Apparently, the way that this stopped was that the police came and threatened to whip the nuns if the meowing didn't stop, which is definitely one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. Number six, peddlers. Ah yes, that medieval businessman just wandering along in the pine forest in hopes of not getting robbed. A classic image from medieval times. The Dark Ages were a dangerous game, right? So one could only imagine how hard it must have been for a merchant who travels the countryside for a living to sell goods. In Breath of the Wild, you're like, oh thank god, there's that one guy with all the goods that I need. How convenient is this? Awesome. That's not in real life. In the Middle Ages, traveling village to village wasn't an easy task. You couldn't order an Uber and then Voila, and unless 
once you were a knight, you probably didn't have a noble steed to take you there. But even so, an outsider showing up to your village to sell goods from a distant land, I don't know, sounds a little sus if you ask me personally. Peddlers were more often than not welcomed with suspicion by locals. Most of the time, peddlers were just accused of being criminals, even if they weren't. Guy shows up, he's like, hey, wanna buy some watches? They're like, you're a robber, you're going away. In our number five spot today, we have wedding baths. This is one of the most serious of all of the wedding traditions that were seen in ancient Greece, and it was a key part of the pre-wedding rituals for brides-to-be. This ritual bath involved water being carried in a special ceremonial vase called the lutrophore to the bride's chamber for this bathing practice. This ritual was actually so important to the people of the time that much of the time, should a young woman meet an untimely fate before being married, they would still perform this bathing ritual on the woman post-mortem. Sometimes they would even be buried with the ceremonial vase as well, even though they had never had the chance to marry. This ceremony was intended to purify the bride and also to enhance her ability to have children. It was seen as the most important milestone in a girl's journey from adolescence into adulthood. In our number four spot today, we have courtly love. So we've discussed a bit about how medieval marriages were mostly about the transferring of wealth and land and really didn't have much, if anything, to do with love. This would obviously be a less than ideal way of living, so to make things a little more bearable, there was the practice of courtly love. This, of course, was for members of the court and it allowed lords and ladies to experience love despite their marital status. This was actually a huge hit and so many people became involved that there ended up being a list of rules posted, one of which included the rule, marriage is no real excuse for not loving. The courtly love saw people doing things such as dancing and giggling, and if they really wanted to get a little risque, they'd even hold hands. Sex, of course, was forbidden, however, because there are some boundaries while you're married, all right? It's just sad that people were in these loveless marriages and had to resort to things like this, all because they simply weren't allowed to marry for love. I am glad, though, that they were able to have some kind of freedom, I guess. In our number three spot today, we have double consanguinity. Double consanguinity is the case that comes up when there is consanguinity from two sources, meaning some sort of familial relationship from two places. This was important in medieval times because it was common for two siblings and one royal family to marry two siblings from another royal family. The children of these couples would be considered double first cousins. They would be allowed to marry as first cousins, but they technically had an even closer biological relationship than first cousins did. This might be a little strange to a lot of us now, based on most of our ways of living and the law, but these rules were formed before the concept of genetic relationships and DNA was even known, so there of course would seemingly be nothing wrong with it during those times in history. In our number two spot today, we have the Viking party. Okay, we've all been to a wedding before where we maybe got a little too loose, had a little too much fun, but let me tell you right now, no one did it like the Vikings. An important aspect of a Viking wedding ceremony was mead. It was a legal requirement for the bride and groom to drink a specially brewed bride ale together at the feast that took place after the wedding ceremony. It was an important step in making sure that the marriage was a binding one. The happy couple would need to ensure that there was at least a month's worth of ale ready for the wedding day, and it needed to be continually drunk throughout their honeymoon as well. The first serving of the bride ale was presented to the groom by his new wife in what was known as the loving cup. Before the groom takes his first sip, he would likely consecrate the ale to Thor by making the sign of a hammer over it and a toast to Odin. Then he would sip the ale before passing the cup to his wife. She would then make a toast to Freya before having her sip, and then it was officially party time. In our number one spot today, we have purity. Of course, women have been subject to the weird standards of purity for hundreds and hundreds of years, but it was so bad in the medieval times that it was very common for women to have to take a type of purity test in order to assure her new husband. We won't get into the multitude of reasons why that is both horrible and extremely bizarre because we would be here all day, but I will talk about this test that they felt necessary to do. For royals, the wedding night was usually watched by observers, which is very weird, but in an even weirder turn of events, after the marriage was consummated, it was normal for the sheets to be checked for blood. For people who were lower class, they didn't usually have observers, but there was apparently a rule for these couples that would allow the local ruler to have sex with the bride on her wedding night before the groom. But this is debated by some historians, and I truly hope that this one is actually untrue. I 
number 10, shaming parades. If you've ever watched Game of Thrones, then you might be familiar with that scene where Cersei gets paraded through the streets of King's Landing while naked and while someone behind her rang a bell chanting, shame. Ding, 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 shame. You know what I mean? It's kind of a meme, but it's also based on a real medieval tradition called shaming parades. For years, people have loved shaming others. I think it's just human nature at this point. And obviously, back then, they didn't have any social media to use as their preferred method of ripping on someone, so they got creative. Very creative. Depending on what the accused did, their punishment would vary. But the one thing that stayed constant was them being paraded through the streets for everyone to watch. Specific punishments were given for specific crimes. For example, if a tavern owner served bad beer, then they would be paraded through the street and forced to drink their bad beer. If they were caught stealing a pig, then they would walk through the streets with a dead pig around their neck and a crown made of pig's feet. How regal. People would throw things like glass, rocks, and even dead cats at whoever was being paraded, and it was quite the spectacle. Now, would you rather experience this or being canceled on social media? Let me know. At number nine, bloodletting. Back in the dark ages, medicine just wasn't the greatest. Clearly, I mean, they had a plague that wiped out 50% of the population in Europe. Even their quote unquote doctors were overlapping jobs. Barbers were cutting hair, obviously, but they were also setting broken bones and bandaging wounds, so I'm not really sure I would trust that, but back then it was a case of you get what you get, so I don't think people were really complaining too much about their barber Joey down the street giving them a cast, you know? But other than the practice of patching wounds and whatnot, they were also practicing bloodletting back then, and it was a little much. Bloodletting was the practice of withdrawing blood in order to cure or prevent illnesses or diseases, so doctors would use things like leeches to suck out the blood of their patients, but they also used scarification methods to scrape away the skin to drain the blood, and others used lancets to slice open veins, sometimes including the jugular vein. I am so glad that we do not do this anymore because frankly, I would like my blood to stay inside my body, thank you. Now before we carry on talking about just how weird things were back in the dark ages, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far and while you're at it, maybe think about smashing that subscribe button as well to see more videos like this one. On number eight, day drinking. Day drinking is a thing. You know, when you're with the homies and you pour yourself a glass of sangria and take a walk around the neighborhood in the middle of the afternoon. Not saying I've ever done that. It's usually a once in a blue moon type of deal, but for people in the dark ages, day drinking was an everyday affair. Now, people back then weren't necessarily drinking at all hours of the day just to get plastered and stay plastered. It was actually for health reasons. You see, people tried to avoid drinking the water at all costs over fears of illness because the water just wasn't clean and wasn't safe to drink, so they turned to the next closest thing that they could drink, and that just so happened to be alcohol. Back then, it was common to drink large amounts of beer, cider, or wine, and it was common to be drunk all of the time. Thank God we can safely drink water now because I don't think anyone could handle the hangover that came with all that heavy drinking. At number seven, no pleasure. The Dark Ages were heavily immersed in religion. In medieval Europe, they took Christianity very seriously and people followed the church very closely. The mission of people back then was to live a good Christian life and to not commit any sins, but one of those sins was a little unfortunate when you look back on it. Back then, any sexual acts that were meant for pleasure and not for procreation creation was considered a sin. That meant that sexy time was reserved for furthering the population and that's it. And if you did anything recreational, you would be getting a one-way ticket to hell. Along those same lines, it was also believed that female domination was also a sin and so the woman could not get on top or again, straight to hell with her. One saint, Francesca Romana, was so afraid of experiencing pleasure when she slept with her husband that she literally burned her lady bits with hot fat so that it would make the experience as miserable as possible. That sounds horrible. At number six, cemetery fun. What types of things do you guys like to do for fun? Do you play video games or read? Or maybe you watch Netflix or YouTube, huh? And where do you like to go for fun? Maybe the mall or to your friend's house? Well, if you lived in the dark ages in Europe, you would go to the place that everyone goes for fun. 
the cemetery. Yep, you're gonna go kiki it up with the corpses and unfortunately they're not corpse husband, although corpse, if you're watching, hit me up. Thank you. Anyways, back in the dark ages, the cemetery was the place to be. It was considered to be the social hub of the community. Back then, people held theater performances, elections, trials, and even set up businesses in the cemetery because the graveyard shops were exempt from taxes. There was quite a lot going on in the cemetery, but it was almost the equivalent of going to the mall. But I want you guys to tell me if you would ever be like the people in the dark ages and just go to the cemetery for fun. Number five, let's reuse, reduce, and recycle our rotten food. More questionable cure-alls. As I mentioned in point number eight, moldy bread was used by doctors for medical reasons such as medicine or gauzing techniques. This is because Egyptians, from what we can gather, seem to have figured out the antibiotic properties and believed the exposure of mold to a wound would better aid in the immune system for next time, if not at least help quicker healing process this time. But Egyptians also reused other rotten foods. For example, sour milk was also used medicinally. Believed bathing in it would help with skin disease or dryness. I mean, all that sand is bound to have a little bit of a chafy effect. Honey, which also happens to be a natural bacteria killer, may not have been rotten, but it was put on open wounds, similar to how we use polysporin today. And while rotten donkey liver may not have been medicine, the Egyptians were quick to slather it on their head and get a nice even dye job. Number four in our countdown is a different kind of rotten, the casual neck. The Egyptians were known for their fascination with life, death, and sex. In their beliefs, the god Ra actually created the universe and the first two gods through master. Osiris, another god who eventually came along, became father to Horus posthumously after Isis had sex with his dead body. Ra also had sex with Osiris posthumously, but it seems his use of onion juice worked pretty well and he didn't father any children with the dead body. Now, just because it's in their godly pantheon doesn't mean just anyone was necrophilic in ancient Egypt, but those who were may have had that lust arguably feeling a little more justified in their pursuit of rotten ladies. So, there was an issue with necrophilic towards the deceased bodies of Egyptian women, to the extent that their loved ones began a habit of letting their corpses sit out for two, three days before passing them to the embalmers, so as to dissuade sex. The logic was is that the embalmers wouldn't want to have sex with the body that was already beginning to rot. I mean, they shouldn't want to have sex with the body in the first place, but I guess beggars can't be choosers. Regardless, next embalmers were apparently common enough for the Grecian writer Herodotus, who famously documented a lot of cultures practices to make special note of. Let's take a break from the funky stuff to talk about a different kind of pussy. Number three, the obsession with cats. Guys, I am super biased to this one. Don't know if you can notice the fine sheen of cat hair I rep, but I'm with the ancient Egyptians on the cat praise. Ancient Egyptians were obsessed with cats and even worshipped them. Believed to be gatekeepers of the underworld, these little beasts were spiritual and metaphorical symbols for Egyptians, and they were even believed to be gods themselves. The act of harming, eating, or killing a cat warranted a death penalty as a result. And while adoring your family pet isn't bizarre, the effects of worshipping something are. When the family cat died, every member in the household would shave off their eyebrows to mourn its death. And if a building was burning, people would save the cats before they even put out the fire. Being the first society to domesticate cats, Egyptians used cats for extermination aside from the companionship, which worked so well that their agricultural society dominated that of the Mediterranean for hundreds of years. Of course, there were cons to this obsession. For example, when the Persian invaders showed up using cats as shields, the Egyptian army retreated in fear of killing a cat, allowing the invaders to their soldiers and the pharaoh and take over rule of Egypt. Oops. Unlike other animals, cats were often mummified and buried in tombs dedicated to the goddess Bastet. Recovered cat figurines made of wood, stone, and bronze can be found in museums and collections all across the world. Number two is a modern day medical emergency, but to ancient Egyptians, it was just his time of the month. While it's astounding that medical accomplishments that Egyptians had made, specialized doctors, antibiotics, even surgery, you can see from their contraceptives in point six, Egyptians didn't always nail it. In fact, the disease Shitso Matsasia, we'll just call it by its second name, Bilharzia, was so common that they didn't even realize it was a disease and it infected nearly everyone. How did it slip under the radar though? The side effects of the disease make people feel sick and it caused blood in their urine and fecal matter. Seeing as menstruation also came with bloody urine and feeling sick, Egyptians simply thought they were menstruating and came to accept that men had to do the same as women. Blood and urine became a normal part of growing up for boys, and Egyptian society was already very big on gender nonconformity, even having records 
records of sex changes, so this really wasn't outlandish thinking to them. In reality, Bilharzia was actually parasitic worms having a field day in their junk. And regardless, a man peeing blood was even treated as a sign of his fertility. No better sign a man was ready to father a family than being infected with parasites. Man, what a trip this countdown has been. You may be wondering what can take the cake. It's the ceremonial circle in at number one. So as prior mentioned, ancient Egyptians believed Ra to have created much of life and existence through, well, his masturbatory sessions. This was also believed about the Nile River, Egypt's famous river that flows 6600 kilometers before it empties into the Mediterranean Sea. These ancient Egyptians believed that the flow of the river represented the frequency of Ra's eject Seeing as the Nile was the source of Egyptian agriculture, it was incredibly important that that flow remains. Well, it's 4000 BC, and everyday people don't exactly see their gods wandering around. So, with their pharaoh being the personification of God, the duty fell onto him. So, once a year, in the last month of summer, during the festival Min that celebrated the pharaoh's rule, the pharaoh would approach the Nile, remove his robe, and master over the Nile River in a sacred public ceremony. He had a large retinue of men that would also mass into the river at the same time as him. Once the pharaoh and his men had, well, finished, any man was welcome to unload in the river too. It was believed that these cultural and religious practices would ensure that the Nile would continue to flow for the next year to come. At number 10, fashion. Back in the Dark Ages, fashion and high quality clothing were a symbol of status in society. For the elite, it was their way of displaying their wealth and high status over the poorer population. Because this meant so much to them, obviously they had to go above and beyond with their looks and oh boy oh boy, did they take things to a whole new level. Everything was super exaggerated. For women, they just wore the finest dresses, but for men, that's where things got spicy. Male fashion was quite something. They would often wear dangerously short tunics with tights and belts to really snatch their waist, followed by the cod piece to really accentuate things down under, you know? But their shoes. Don't even get me started on their shoes. They wore some seriously pointy shoes, and to them, the longer and pointier, the better. Their elf looking kicks were really what screamed, I'm better than you, to the rest of the public. Some shoes were so long that they had to be reinforced with whalebone to keep their shape. These people looked pretty ridiculous, at least to our modern standards, but back then, wearing pointy shoes and tunics with the cod piece was like the equivalent to wearing a full Gucci fit. And number nine, helmeted chickens. In the dark ages, peasants didn't really get the best food. The good stuff was more so saved for the members of the elite, and these people ate some good stuff. I mean, to us it's weird, but to them, it was finger licking good. Speaking of finger licking good though, let me tell you about one of their weirdest foods, helmeted chicken. No, it wasn't a special chicken that was prepared with special ingredients or whatever. It was literally what the name is, a helmeted chicken, AKA a chicken with a helmet on. I know, weird, right? This was a theatrical dish to say the least. It featured a regular old cooked chicken that was stitched to a pig like he was riding on its back, and to add a special little something something, the cooks would fashion a tiny helmet to make it look like a guard or knight for whatever lord or king that they were serving this bizarre dish to. This was a fan favorite because of how extravagant it was, but that trend sort of lived and died in the dark ages because you can't catch any chef doing something like that these days. Gordon Ramsay would have a fit over this one. Before I carry on telling you guys about all of the weird and crazy things that people did back in the dark ages, I would first like to ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and also consider subscribing as well to see more videos like this one. At number eight, beautiful death. Death was kind of a big deal in the dark ages. Sounds weird, but you also have to take into account the fact that the average life expectancy was only about 30 years old, so really, you didn't have long. Also, people back then were faced with some pretty harsh times like famine, cold, and of course, the Black Death. Because they had to face death so early on and so often, the so-called art of dying came to be. The whole premise behind the art of dying revolved around dying a good Christian death. According to those who lived in the Dark Ages, your death had to be planned and peaceful. When someone was on their deathbed, they would concern themselves with accepting their fate without quote, despair, disbelief, impatience, pride, or avarice. End quote. This art of dying thing was very popular amongst priests, and this actually led to a lot of painters at the time depicting people in holy professions as submissive to death and what was to come for them. At number seven, Feast of Fools. 
One of the more lively aspects of the Dark Ages was the many festivals and holidays that were celebrated. Though most of the population worked grueling hours for days on end, they often got breaks to hold celebrations. Most holidays and celebrations that were held were religious, but others were just silly and were designed for people to have fun, like the Feast of Fools for example. The Feast of Fools was held in early January and was inspired by the pagan festival of Saturnalia. This was a pretty interesting festival because it involved swapping the highest respected officials with serving maids and they became masters and were crowned kings of misrule. This festival first started as something confined to the church, but soon it became a bigger affair with parades, comic performances, music, costumes, and even drag. These people really liked their festivals. Another pretty weird festival that they held was the Festival of the Ass, where a young girl carrying a child would ride on the back of a donkey into a church, and during the service, instead of saying amen, they would say hee-haw like a donkey. I know, bizarre, right? At number six, soccer. These days, people regard soccer or football as a modern European sport, and though it is popular in these modern times, it turns out that the sport has been around a lot longer than you might think. Soccer was first played back in the Dark Ages, however, it is very different from the soccer that we know today. Back then, the sport didn't even really have a name, and there were no rules either. The only thing that people followed when playing the game was the objective of winning. Back then, you were allowed to win by any means necessary, besides deliberately offing people, of course. Back then, soccer became known as a pretty brutal sport. It was violent, chaotic, bloody, and sometimes even deadly. It involved an infinite amount of players, so it was really a free-for-all on the playing field. The sport was so intense that in 1314, King Edward II banned the game decreeing, quote, on pain of imprisonment, such games to be used in the cities in future, end quote. Glad things have changed since then because FIFA would be really intense if it hadn't. Number five, breaks. Yeah, I've never broken anything, and and I don't plan to. It sounds like the worst thing. I see it on Reddit and I'm like, ooh. But living in ancient Egypt, you're gonna break a bone or dislocate something sometime. But back then, it's not like you can just head over to the emergency and get an x-ray or a cast and then get your buddies, a couple of pharaohs to sign it and get some crutches and be on your way. No. So how did they treat broken bones or dislocations back then? Well, we can look at one example from that Edwin Smith papyrus that I mentioned earlier, where there was a patient with two dislocated clavicles. Now the treatment here is described as follows. If thou examinest a man having a dislocation in his two collarbones, thou shalt find his two shoulders turned over and the heads of his two collarbones turned towards his face. Imagine reading this and you're like, okay, uh, I think we turn this this way? No, this way, hang on. Thou shouldn't cause them to fall back so that they rest in their places. Thou shalt bind it with stiff rolls of linen and thou shalt treat it afterwards with grease and honey every day. Yeah, if you break something, don't put grease and honey on. Go to the doctors. Hit that thumbs up. There we go. The more we know. Number four, dental surgery. Okay, so back in the ancient Egyptian world, it's not like you can go to the dentist, get your teeth checked and cleaned, whatever, once a year, however you do it, I don't know. And the diet of the ancient Egyptian was most definitely not exactly, you know, the cleanest. If I can say that, you wouldn't have a set of pearly whites every single day, that's for sure. And that's due to the fact that the tools used to grind food would often leave traces of sand and or stone behind, which, well, in your mouth, is not gonna feel too good. That would cause tooth loss or troubles at an early age. Through documents found, there have been a few different dental treatments from that time, and they're a little interesting, like topical treatments and such. But one case was able to give us a glimpse into what is believed to be the treatment of an abscess, and yeah. Buckle up. Even more interesting is a mummy that was found from the fourth dynasty. Now this mummy and his first molar, a bunch of surgically produced holes were there that they believe were used to drain an abscess, which clearly gives us some very tangible evidence that dental surgeries were performed back then in some way, shape, or form. I mean, in the form of a bunch of holes, and it's disgusting, but they tried. And do remember, as you're watching this entire video, all this was done without any anesthetic. So drilling holes, breaking bones, putting linen into your arms, you're gonna feel all of it. Number three, Anubis. Anubis, the ancient Egyptian god of mummification. Yeah, he, uh, he had an interesting hobby, this one. Anubis, historically, he oversaw the embalming process during mummification. A lot of steps involved in mummification, so the backup here, you know, the backseat driving, that is Anubis, I'm sure was appreciated. Ancient Egyptians were so sophisticated in the mummification process that they also had to get really good at another major, well, kind of creepy, surgery, and that is the postmortem dissection. That matters, that's a pretty important step. See, in order to mummify the body, 
they needed to remove any moisture from it. Now this process included the removal of brain tissue, which was done through a quite a gruesome hook tool and some steady hands, that's for sure. This was not a medical practice, however, it was more of a spiritual one, right? It wasn't done by doctors, and this is exactly why they were getting extra up close and personal with internal organs during this process. The medical information they gathered during this process was never used for medical or medical advancement, but rather for spiritual, like Anubis, this ancient wonder. He kept trophies from those that he embalmed, like, you know, different parts from people, that kind of thing. Word spread, you know, hey, Anubis likes body parts, pass it on, this guy's weird. So in turn, for centuries now, Egyptians would then offer pieces of lifeless bodies to Anubis. They're like, you know what, hey, heard you like toes, big guy. Here you go, enjoy, put that in your jar. You'll love it. Whoever gave him the jackal head, great call. That was a great call. He loves that one. Big fan. Number two, dirty trick. The god Osiris ruled over ancient Egypt, but it wasn't an easy path, okay? Just like ancient Rome, there's always a jealous brother or a jealous someone watching from the bushes, okay? Osiris's brother, Set, he was a jealous one. So he tried to take out Osiris at every single turn. Now, what elaborate plot was so crazy that it actually worked? This was like a saw trap set up. This is insane. So first, Set designed a coffin that fit Osiris's measurements, like to a T. So at a party, casually one day, Set challenged Osiris to hop into said coffin, saying, challenging, that if he can fit inside of it, the coffin is his. Yeah, like a gift. So for some reason, Osiris accepted the challenge, he jumped in, and as soon as Osiris got into the coffin, bam, Set locked him inside and threw the coffin in the Nile River. So in turn, Set then took over control of Egypt. Yeah, gotcha, got the last one there. So if any of your coworkers wanna show you a coffin in the break room, respectfully decline the offer. It's, uh, it's probably a trap. And finally, number one, scarab worship. Yeah, we're getting stinky for the last one. Ancient Egyptians, they worshipped scarabs. They worshipped dung beetles. Now, when we think about animals in relation to ancient Egyptians, we go to cats first. But really, it was dung beetles the whole time. They're OG, those little stinkers. Egyptians could not keep their hands or their minds off of dung beetles. The Egyptians would observe scarabs rolling these balls of dung, and they would roll them along the ground until suddenly each beetle would disappear just like that into a hole in the sand. Now, ancient Egyptians compared these patterns to that of the sun, which of course would go over and then leave at the end of the day. Just the ball rolling and then disappears. I can see the connections. Now the god Kefri was depicted as a man with a massive scarab as a head. So he was responsible for rolling the sun across the sky every single day. Number 10, weddings. When we look back on history, the traditions of marriages generally stand out as unique ways to peer into the lives of ancient civilizations. With the Vikings, marriages were generally done as ways to join houses through blood ties, which were rarely romantic. Traditionally held on Friday, the day of Freya, goddess of fertility, the couple was separated to go through separate rituals. The bride would take a bath and also remove the kronsen, which symbolized her status as a woman who was unwed and store it for her future daughter. The groom would then go and break into his ancestor's tomb and steal their stuff, uh, usually their swords. During the ceremony, Ceremony, rings and family swords would be exchanged, and a feast would be had in their honor. During this, one tradition was to stab their swords into a pillar. The deeper the sword went, the better their marriage would be, and the more children they'd have. Number 9. Teeth Painting when exhuming the many skeletons of Vikings that have passed throughout history, a remarkable detail was found throughout all of them. Notches of varying size, depth, and length were found to have been cut into the teeth of these ancient warriors. The reason for their existence was something of a mystery. Furthermore, comparing the style to historical Vikings, the name of the Danish king Harold Bluetooth suggests that his title may have been slightly more literal than initially thought. This would have been achieved through the application of a mixture of resins and dyes, though whether or not it was permanent would be hard to know for sure, since the evidence has long since rotted away. Number 8. Blonde Hair The image of the Viking as a blonde-haired, blue-eyed warrior is prolific and also wrong. While the majority of Vikings were observed to be blonde and described as such, this was actually due to an extremely early application of hair dye. That being said, this wasn't solely due to fashion, though blonde hair was considerably valued in Viking society. The method in which Vikings dyed their hair was through the use of lye, which contains potassium 
potassium. Potassium can often strip the pigmentation off of hair, and if Vikings washed frequently, which they actually did, they were weirdly hygienic, then it would lead to their hair gradually being dyed blonde. A side effect of this was that lye was also extremely toxic to lice, which helped prevent outbreaks on ships. Number 7. Torches. Moving straight from hygiene to… whatever this is. Starting a fire is extremely hard. You'll see two guys rubbing sticks together in the movies and suddenly fire appears, but you know what? That doesn't work at all. The conditions for friction alone being enough to start a fire have to be absolutely perfect. The right temperature, the right humidity, the dryness, all of it. So this is why people decided to find other methods for starting fires such as flint, a material that is fairly easy to find wherever you go. But with flint you also need tinder, and this is where it gets a little weird. It always gets weird with tinder. The Vikings had a particular species of mushroom that they'd use for their torches, which they would carefully prepare and then boil in their own urine. Well, Because, and it's honestly more likely that they found this out through trial and error, they probably didn't actually know the chemicals and all this, urine contains sodium nitrate, which burns real good, as it's a chemical neighbor of potassium nitrate, which is found in gunpowder. This was actually a fairly common technique for creating torches at the time, and you know, just really cool. If not, like, you know, really weird. Number six, the 81 Yule offerings. Christmas is coming, and if you're a Viking, that usually isn't a great thing. Not because of the Norse gods or anything, Vikings were actually pretty quick to pick up Christianity, but more because Christmas was the time where a pretty brutal ritual would take place. Specifically referred to as Yule, the ritual was estimated to have been in honor of family members that had passed away, and generally involved singing, dancing, and killing 81 men to offer their heads to the gods. Merry Christmas! Always way too long or too personal or you know what, just too depressing. Just way too sad, just tears. You're like, why? Why are we talking about this? It's a nerve wracking part, even as a guest, just to get up randomly and be like, okay, look at me everyone, hi. No, I don't want to do that. Back in the 1800s though, only men were allowed to give these toasts. The oldest friend, the groom, the best man, and then the father of the bride. The whole thing would have been done in 8 minutes. Guys suck at speeches. They're just like, uh, uh, a lot of ums, that's all I'm saying. Wedding toasts go back as far as the 6th century BC. When Greeks were getting married, the father of the bride would drink the first glass of wine just to make sure it wasn't poisoned or anything. Romans would also drop a piece of burnt toast into the wine in order to make the wine taste less bitter, hence the term toast. Yeah, now we get it. Yeah, wine was so bad back then they had to use burnt toast crystal light just to get through the day. Yuck. At number 4, transaction. I find it to be just a little bit messed up how before now marriage was mostly about money or status and not about love. For a long time people didn't get to choose who they got to marry and there was almost always some kind of monetary transaction involved in the wedding. This whole idea here is a reason for the traditional act of the bride's father walking her down the aisle and giving her away so to speak. In the past fathers of the bride and groom would come together to establish an agreement like X amount of money for someone's daughter or whatever. Once that was set up, the wedding became a big deal to see if the transaction would actually go through and many precautions were put in place to make sure that no one backed out. One of those precautions was the act of the father walking his daughter down the aisle. This was done so that they stayed close to one another in the off chance that the groom or his family decided to back out. That really took the romance and sparkle out of weddings now. Number 3. Wedding Cake as the youngest of three, I can confirm that we get away with the most. The youngest often do. The middle child is just plain ignored, and then the oldest, well they usually have the most responsibility in the family. Usually when a bride and groom cut the cake on their big day, it's for them. They save a piece till their anniversary, they put it in their partner's face, it's fun, whatever they want to do. Often in history, the eldest child would get the first slice. How lucky is that? When it came down to cutting the actual cake too, well that meant that the bride is no longer a virgin. It's an awkward few bites. Wedding cakes today are delicious and they're pretty much an art form. TV shows are devoted to them, like Cake Boss and 
other cake shows that I can't think of. If you're lucky, you might find a few cake charms on the inside as well back in the day. Real, non-edible cake charms. You wanted to find these in your cake. They brought good omens to the table. To find a rocking chair meant that you are going to live a long life. An anchor means you're bound for adventure, sailors ahoy. And a purse meant that you would have good fortune. Let's just hope you didn't find the charms with your teeth or else you would be using said new fortune fixing your chiclets. Very metal, very real. <laughs> Not good. At number two, plague flowers. In a lot of weddings, the flowers are very important. There's the flowers for the centerpieces, the bouquets for the bride and bridesmaids. There's flowers everywhere. Get your Benadryl. But why is that? Well, the idea of carrying a bouquet at a wedding dates back to ancient Greece, where it was believed that carrying a bouquet was thought to ward off evil spirits. But a little later on down the line, the presence of bouquets at weddings got a little bit darker and a little more precautionary. During the Middle Ages into the Renaissance, when the Black Death was running rampant throughout Europe, people were trying anything and everything to try and ward off the plague. Back then, people believed that smells carried contagion, so people would fill their pockets with fragrant things to keep the plague at bay. This was later integrated into wedding practices and brides started carrying around a bouquet of stinky stuff like garlic and dill to protect them from catching anything. Over the years, the stinky stuff was replaced with nice smelling flowers, but really, no one cares what's in the bouquet anymore because all people want to do is participate in the wedding hunger games and fight to the death to catch the bouquet at the end of the night. Why? Why are we hurting each other for this? Why? And finally, number one, wedding rings. One ring to rule them all. Perhaps the most important piece of the wedding puzzle, rings. Whenever somebody is about to pop the question, everybody around them always needs to see the ring. Congrats, let me see the ring. Oh my God, is it this, is it this? Egyptian pharaohs first used rings to represent this eternal life. The circle has no beginning or ending. They created this concept that we adore to this day. The center of the ring was also believed to be the gateway to the unknown. Finger just disappears, you're like, what the f these Egyptian Ouroboros rings were the first, a snake eating its own tail, hashtag love. When Greeks came in the picture, they took this tradition, started using copper and iron rings in ceremonies, and the iron rings had a key symbol on them, meaning that the wife now has control of the house. If you like it, then you should have put a key on it. Come medieval times, the ring gets another upgrade. Now we have these precious gems to be added to them, a little bit more glam. Rubies symbolized passion, sapphires symbolized the heavens, and diamonds to show strength, because they were Rock hard, and obviously, you know the rest. Come the 12th century, the Christian church declared marriage as a holy sacrament, so rings were solely used now for that ceremony. That's when the engagement ring came into place. There needed to be another trade or promise that was just as strong as a wedding band. So now there's rings for pretty much everything. Number 10, apple bobbing. Okay, folks, time to paint a picture for you. I love doing this. It's a warm summer night. You're at the county fair. You've managed to eat enough fried food to feed a large family. And even more surprisingly, you fit into those blue jeans. They're tight. The sound of carnival games and people having fun pollutes the background. That's when you see her. She's tall, blonde, and is wearing a pair of cowboy boots. Yeehaw. She calls you over. There's an apple bobbing game. You've never bobbed for apples before, but to impress the pretty lady in cowboy boots, you go for it anyway. You fail, and now you're cold, wet, and ladyless. Yes, this fine American carnival game gets its roots from the Middle Ages. It's simple, fun, and no matter what time period you live in, sometimes it was even used as a form of dating, which is kind of weird, actually. Names were written on the apples, kind of like speed dating, and then you'd bob for them, and then you'd go off of whoever's name was on the apple. I I've done it before. I'm not very good at apple bobbing. And now I'm just cold, wet, and maidenless. Number nine, Kitty Bonfire. This is the worst. Yeah, I've talked a lot about a lot of naughty stuff in my time here as the king of the hive, but this one, it just sucks, dude. Look, we've all been bored before. I have too. Have we all done stupid things when we're bored? Yes. Remember Roman candles? You point them at each other, you shoot the fireworks at each other. Some of you have done it. Don't lie to me. I know you did. Sure, that's just a part of growing up though. However, growing up in the Middle Ages, and more specifically in France, uh, they liked to have barbecues. Except it wasn't delicious mouth-watering ribs or chicken, it was cats. And it wasn't for eating, but just for entertainment. Yeah, just for a, a, a good old laugh. Uh, don't have time today, but I've got a great story about a stray cat. Maybe I'll, I'll use that for my first stand-up routine, we'll see. But regardless, I'm just trying to have fun in this one because it just makes me sad. Let's move on to the next one. Number eight, mob football. Football is the world sport. Name a country, they probably have a team in it. 
And Canada might even bring the cup home this year, boys and girls. Now that would be cool. However, uh, the billion dollar sport was nothing close to what it is today. Football has rules, regulations, and athletes performing at peak performance. Ronaldo was one heck of a player. In medieval times, there were no rules on how many players there could be. Sometimes it was even whole towns versus one another. The ball? <laughs> Not something you can find in the back of your favorite department store. It was an inflated pig bladder. Ugh. The only goal was to get it to the other side with any means necessary, which oftentimes meant it was going to get physical. A lot, a lot of beating and whatnot, a lot of hitting. Not very good, don't do that. I'll stick uh, not playing that sport, thanks. Number seven, public de-lifing. There were jails and dungeons in medieval times, sure, make no mistake of that. However, a lot of times sentencing for crimes would often lead you to losing your head, where a large sweaty man, such as myself, wearing a black cloth mask would take a very sharp axe, sword, or any other sharp utensil of war from the war cabinet and liberate your head from your shoulders. Thing is, some folks would come out to watch this, as this was apparently a form of entertainment. I mean, why not? I guess, sure. Sure, it's, it's friendly family fun. Bring the youngins, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa. Pack some sandwiches just to make sure, just make sure you stay out of the splash zone. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know why they did that. That was pretty common, that's weird. Number six, Wario shoes. Fashion. I'm not a fashion guy, and I don't claim to be. I don't have the cash flow for it. But one day, I swear, if I got the do re mi, it'll be leisure suits and Frank Sinatra every time I sit down to eat a meal. Gotta have those shoes to match that Frank energy. Shoes that say, yes, I am moderately talented and handsome and have a great following, but I have some shady connections to the Italian mafia. <laughs> Villain energy. Well, what's more villainous than a pair of Wario shoes? Yes, some medieval shoes were big and pointy and sometimes floppy. It was a sign of wealth, class, prestige, and the calling card of a portly Mario doppelganger. Surely you might not even wear these bad boys outside, but that's because you trip and fall, and I wouldn't want to trip and fall out there. I feel like any injury back then is uh, not good for your health. A cut could kill you, you know, you don't want that. Number five, Mamma Mia. The best man at your wedding was most likely the groom's best friend who he most likely met in college and probably was part of his fraternity. And when given the mic to make a speech that was slightly inappropriate for younger audiences, the most common words of his vocabulary were probably bro and dude. All college friends put aside, the best man of the past had more of a greater responsibility than regaling the tale of the kegger at Stacy's house. Besides the feudal government coming to tickle your wife's fancy, there were others who wished to take the bride away, Bowser style. The best man's job was to prevent any of this from happening. Trying to get away with Koopa kidnapping meant the best man was going to do battle with you, or just make sure the bride is protected. Like, you know, trying to run away from an arranged marriage because women are treated like property. Basically, he's a Luigi to Mario, except everyone actually respects Luigi in this case. Number four, arranged marriages. All this stuff sounds awful, and you might be thinking, why do these women go along with this? Well, it's because they didn't have a choice. A lot of women simply didn't have the right to choose who they married. Kind of a rough time for the ladies. I would also hardly call these marriages marriages, as it really was more the lines of something like a business deal or a proposal. Families promise daughters to others. Being basically sold off to someone probably isn't a good feeling. For wealthier families like royals, a lot of times it was just about wealth and power, but also about keeping alliances, keeping borders in check. Your daughter marries my prince, now we're allies. Oh, you've got a son? Great, because I've got a niece that just turned 13. Gross. Number three, marital disputes. I like to joke around in this channel. Ah, oh, hell, who am I kidding? I like to joke around all the time. But this is kind of a touchy subject. But it's the truth. Considering everything else that was going on, and it's not that far from the truth to say, that women probably were not respected well inside the home either. This was a time long before equal rights and the resources that women today still need in case of domestic issues. I, as an internet comedian, cannot do the subject justice as it's something of a more sincere conversation to be had. However, I can talk about it from the medieval times. And some men just needed to be put in the naughty corner, bad. Life was a lot harder for the average average Joe back then, which means it was a lot tougher for the average Jane. Tough conditions don't excuse men treating women that way, but what I'm saying is, it just wasn't a great time overall, especially for the women. Naughty, stay in the naughty corner, you bad medieval men, bad. Number two, mail order. This kind of goes without saying, but men basically just got to pick a wife. Using money, power, or because somebody just owes you a favor. You get to pick out a wife. It was basically like shopping for a new car. You look around, check your options, 
Remember, this is the time when women were treated as property. Perhaps the biggest divide between men and women back then is that while men treat marriages like business or political agreements, they are still looking for love, where for a woman, she just doesn't have that option. Sometimes marriages go bad, but can you imagine what it would be like to be in a marriage you didn't even want to be in from the start? Man, that's rough. Number one, married games. This one is just too weird not to mention. Divorces were not that common back then, till death do you part, and depending on if the church would even allow it, but however, in the yielding times, in the land of Germany, there was a really, really messed up process called trial by combat, which basically meant when husbands and wives needed to work something out or separating, they fought for it, Hunger Games style. The man was placed in a hole to level the playing field, and the woman had a sack of rocks that she would use. Not that any married couple today would ever want to hit each other over the head with anything, right? Come on, that's no, you guys want, you guys love each other. And when this display of happy matrimony was finished and a winner was declared, the other had their light snuffed out. In a nutshell, the only way to divorce or remarry was if your spouse ceased to exist. So, here's some weapons to deal with it. Go ahead, here you go. Crazy. Number 10, the dancing plague. It was a normal summer day in 1518 Strasbourg when all of a sudden patient zero began to twitch and move in a way that was so peculiar. No, this isn't the start of a medieval zombie movie, which actually sounds pretty cool. This was a plague like no other, the dancing plague. A dancing woman shortly began to gather a crowd and more people seemed to strangely dance. More people joined in and then it became the dancing plague, which lasted for days, strangely. Some were taken in for medical treatment for the strange behavior. Today no one is really sure what happened, some think it was the devil's work, scientists today think it could have been a mold induced psychotic incident, and other people think it could be just classic medieval hysteria. However, I like to think it was John Taverner's newest mixtape. Number 9. Rushed Wedding not all marriages back in the medieval times were for political and strategic gain. Some of it was actually for love, and some of it was extremely spontaneous. There wasn't even an official ceremony for a long time, and if you wanted to get married, the two of you just had to both give verbal consent, which is always a good idea. As you can imagine, this meant a lot of people would be getting legally bonded to each other in the streets, at the pubs, and while together in bed, which... Mm, taking into account that people were considered old enough for marriage at obscenely young ages, they were not really thinking with their brains right then. But hey, life was short and love was fiery. But because of this, it was kind of hard to prove the whole thing. So we came up with a lovely way of confirming the whole situation. Number 8, Splash Zone. Let's get it on. Ooh, 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 babe. Let's get it on. Ooh. Man, I love that song. I love the classics. You know, sometimes those moments in life require that special soundtrack. Like, when I'm gaming, I love synth pop. When I party, I'm a man enjoy some Drake. How you doing, buddy? And when it's time to get low, I like the official soundtrack of Shrek. <laughs> what can I say? Cinematic masterpiece. That being said, that's all that needs to happen in those intimate moments. For medieval times and in many places around the world, people would have to watch the signing off of the marriage. This included friends, family, local leaders, and maybe some nobility. You know, just to make sure the marriage uh, went through properly. <laughs> Gee, honey, I can't wait to go home and consummate the marriage. I figure if everyone shows up at 8, they can leave by 8.05. Maybe 8.02. Just stay out of the splash zone. Number 7, Men's Fashion. By far, one of the best ways to show that you are not one of the lowly plebeians back in medieval times would be your clothes. We've talked about how stripes were the pattern of the devil, but they had some weirder trends back in the Middle Ages. For example, long and pointy shoes were a very big sign of wealth, and the longer and pointier the shoe, the more gold pieces were lining your pocket. Men loved to show off their bodies back then too. But they didn't have BMWs back in the day, so one way a dude could compensate for himself was the aptly named codpiece, which was a pouch attached to the front of a man's pantaloons, perfectly shaped and padded to display their masculinity. It's like that one dad at the beach wearing the Speedo, except maybe a little less nightmare inducing. Number 6, Hairless. Nobody wants to go bald, just ask Jada Smith. Medieval times had different thoughts about this, however. Not only was a receding hairline normal, but that was the thing for ladies at the time. You might be thinking it's all about the waist, the legs, or the booty. Well, not back then. So if the forehead is all the rage, focus on it, right? Makes sense. How is this done? 
Well, you can start by plucking those lashes. Don't need those. Then pluck the eyebrows. Ain't gonna need those either. And just start reeling back that hairline. Oh, perfect. Now you're ready for a night on the town. The history of women's fashion and traditions is a story of pain, beauty, and some really weird choices. Number five, Feast of Fools. The Feast of Fools was a very popular festival in the Middle Ages where everything turned topsy turvy. On January 1st, specifically in France, they would elect a mock bishop or pope, and low and high officials would change places. Kind of like an adaptation of the pagan celebration of Saturnalia, which we talked about in another video. Find it and post it below. People would wear hideous masks to conceal themselves from the festivities so they could behave fully in the activities. There would be parades throughout the city featuring drinking, singing, men would dress as women and vice versa, along with the general mischief. Even priests and clergy would be seen wearing masks during office hours and dance as women, panders, or minstrels. It was officially banned in the 15th century because it got too ridiculous and you know the piety of the people were like, this is a sin. But despite the ban, it still continued into the 16th century. It seems like a pretty hard party to imagine. Imagine, especially considering how pious they were back then, priests dancing in women's clothes, crazy. I mean, technically they're already wearing kind of dresses, their long tunics. Number four, bloodletting. Along with traditions, there were certain medical practices that medieval physicians swore by. The most popular being bloodletting. Got a headache? Bloodletting. Have a flesh wound? Bloodletting. The plague? Hmm. Bloodletting. Emotions? Uh, maybe a little bit of bloodletting. It is exactly as it sounds. They would either make cuts to let the blood drip or more usually place leeches on the skin. The rationale behind bloodletting though is really important. It was related to the belief in the four basic humors, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. This translated to the four basic elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Being ill meant something was off with the humors and therefore relieving an excess of humor was necessary. Therefore, if there was an excess of blood, it would be removed by bloodletting. If it was bile, they would purge it. Uh, blood was declared the dominant humor by Galen of Pergamum way back in 200 AD. So bloodletting became the most popular. This tradition even lasted beyond the Middle Ages into the 18th century. In the 1800s, the French went through 40 million leeches a year, uh, and also things started to get weird when George Washington was bloodlet when he had got, fell sick with a cold, he died that way, it was a lot. Number three, here lies the heart. As you can expect, death was everywhere in the Middle Ages. I probably, I wouldn't have made it past the age of four. I had tonsillitis too many times. That's probably true for most of us. Making it past child rearing years for women was outstanding. For men, you'd be lucky if you made it past 30. Tough times. So it only makes sense we talk about some of their unusual funeral rites. There were many superstitions around burials, fear of disease, and even vampirism determined what would happen to the body. Eastern Europeans would stake bodies through the heart in order to keep them from returning. Especially if they had taken their own life, they would have to be beheaded. When a village was cursed by plague, drought, flooding, or something other, they would dig up the bodies to investigate, sometimes burning them because they thought, ooh, wow, what's happening? Their nails are retracting, they must be a vampire. During plague time, the normal burial methods were abandoned and they had to resort to mass graves. But on the battlefield, there was actually a very sweet tradition. If a loved one died on the field and the body could not be transported back, the heart would be removed instead. It would either be kept in a box of ivory with spices or buried somewhere. Number two, the mystery plays. If you weren't busy trying to avoid the Black Dead, then you might have attended something called a mystery play. Mystery plays were a sequence of performances referred to at times as the cycle plays. During the 15th and 16th century, before playhouses were even a thing, these plays were performed annually in the biggest towns in Britain. They were called mystery plays because they primarily addressed the miraculous mysteries of God himself. Throughout the whole course of the day, the whole arc of the universe from Garden of Eden all the way to Judgment Day was performed. They were organized and funded by acting guilds, which was another reason as to why they were called mystery plays. The troops themselves were called mysteries. The troops were often made up of craftsmen who would use the show to show off their wares. The performers were ordinary people with a flair for the dramatic, but they had to be damn good, otherwise they would get 
vegetables thrown at them. People looked forward to these performances all year round, so it was standing O or nothing. And last but not least, soccer. Like most sports, soccer actually has a pretty violent origin, kind of like lacrosse, though it was still considered a game. Soccer, aka the more accurate title, I have to say football, because football had far less rules. It could have an infinite number of players and could take part across an entire village. The goals were sometimes set miles apart and the game would often be used to settle disputes. As a result, they would they got they got violent. They got really, really violent. You could <laughs> you could do absolutely anything in order to get the ball, save actually taking someone's life. It also wasn't strictly football. You could use any part of your body to, to get there. Wrestling, punching, kicking, scratching, tripping, you name it. If it got you a goal, fair game. But it is all fun and games until someone's eye gets poked out. In 1314, King Edward II decided it was time to put a damper on the game that was causing too much injury and property damage. He forbade the games and condemned any who disobeyed to imprisonment, but you can imagine that people didn't play by those rules either, because uh, soccer still exists today somehow. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Wards of the King. This messed up marriage tradition comes from the Dark Ages, the medieval times, and during these times, since people were seen less as people and more as what they can provide, orphans who were wealthy female heiresses, as well as wealthy widows, all became wards of the king. That is dark in itself, but since marriage is all about money, the king used these people to his advantage. These women could be married off to the men of the court who wanted to increase their wealth and land, or a lord who would also be able to sell her marriage to the highest bidder in order to make up for the loss of income she would have provided. If one of these women went and married someone on her own accord, she would then lose the money that was rightfully hers. How absolutely backwards is that? In our number 9 spot today, we have the Bridal Bouquet. The Bridal Bouquet is definitely a classic staple in Western society now, but it wasn't always just a nice aesthetic touch. The idea of the Bridal Bouquet has a much different history. It is said that ancient Greek brides would often wear wreaths of mint and marigold meant to serve as an aphrodisiac for the newlyweds, but I want to take us over to the Middle Ages. During this time, things and people were filthy. The concept of hygiene didn't really exist in the way that it does now, and this meant that people were usually pretty smelly. This is why it became tradition for brides walking down the aisle to carry a bouquet that was full of herbs like dill and garlic. The bouquet served as a sort of deodorant for the bride, and it also worked to ward off evil spirits. Sort of like an awesome two for one deal right there in one bouquet. Dill was also like a triple whammy because apparently it too is considered an aphrodisiac. So having some on hand post nuptials pre consummation was just the icing on the cake for the pair. In our number eight spot today, we have the bridal veil. There are a lot of historical wedding traditions that have to do with warding off evil spirits. People were really concerned about that back in the day. This is one of the major factors behind why the bridal veil was created. Back in Roman times, the veil was actually a red sheet called a flamium, which was meant to look like fire so as to scare off any evil spirits that were lurking around. In Greece, the veil was often yellow for the same reason. Over time, the color changed, but the intent remained the same. It was worn as a sort of protection. In the end, another reason for the use of the veil was to assist in arranged marriages. What I mean by this is that back in the day, when marriage was simply more of a business exchange than anything, sometimes veils were used to hide the identity or appearance of the bride from the groom. Definitely not the most kind tradition there's ever been. In our number seven spot today, we have wedding rings. Both wedding and engagement rings are common in our society today, but this practice has been around for quite some time, although it used to mean a very different thing. The tradition of wedding ring exchange can be traced back to ancient Rome, but it wasn't an exchange that happened between partners at the wedding ceremony and was instead something that was given by Roman men to to the father of the bride as a symbol of his purchase. This practice later evolved into the bride being given a gold ring that she would wear, which was meant to symbolize the fact that the groom had placed his trust in her. He was trusting her with his property. As for the reason we wear rings on our fourth finger, well, rings have been worn on many fingers throughout history, but the reason why this finger was chosen was because it was believed that the fourth finger held a vein that led to the heart, which in Latin was called the vena amoris, or the vein of of love. 
In our number 6 spot today we have the Bridal Auction. Ancient Mesopotamia had a slew of rules and customs regarding marriage. There's one thing that the Roman historian Herodotus recorded quite well. While many of his stories are largely unreliable, this is one ancient wedding custom that has thankfully been lost to time. The Bridal Auction was exactly what it sounds like. It was an annual market where young, available women were auctioned off to be married. Those who were considered more beautiful were auctioned off first, and those who were deemed less desirable were auctioned after, along with a quote, monetary compensation, which was said to make up for their appearance. Harsh. Some of the most wealthy men in the area would come to the auction to find the most attractive girl possible, but even some of the men without a bunch of money came to bid a bit later in the game. Number five. Gym Day. Believe it or not, they were around 200 gyms all across Europe during Victorian times. Dudes were getting shredded. Why not? They're like, hey, we don't have dinner, but might as well just work out. These gyms weren't bright, they weren't open, they weren't well ventilated, motivating, safe, none of those things that you need today. No, Victorian gyms were reserved for the upper class. Uh, yes, of course, grab your pocket watch and your blazer, Ezekiel. We're doing some bench pressing today, I guess. Yeah, grab your monocle, for sure, you're gonna need that. These machines, also, they were not ideal to work out, they were designed as antiques first, rather than, you know, their fitness purpose and safety purpose also. Like, half these look like saw traps. There's no way I'm gonna be bending my arm around any of these Victorian devices. Even the machines today at the gym, I'm like, no way, no thank you. Weak gang, here we go. Number four, beauty patches. Okay, we have to bring back beauty patches ASAP. Imagine like if a rapper had a beauty patch. Nelly had the band-aid, but we gotta have like beauty patches. We gotta like, you know, mix it up a bit. Bring back the facial feature game. These patches came in all shapes and sizes, of course, in the Victorian era. Even in this portrait from 1755, Joshua Reynolds painted Charles, the ninth Lord Cathcart, rocking a large beauty patch. That looks amazing. He does look like Nelly, honestly. He has like that motivational, like rapper kind of like, you know, he, he's, he's in charge and you can tell from the beauty patch. It's like that that's a lord right there with that one of those. Take it off, no lord. Put it back on, lord. The reason for these patches back then and sometimes having more than one is because they were commonly used to cover up smallpox scars. They were made out of silk, velvet, and they were applied with glue. So pick a spot and commit. It's gonna be there all day. These patches were dark black and they were meant to make your pale skin pop. Of course, pale skin back then made everyone faint. Pale, pale skin and long shoes, everyone losing their minds. The position of these patches could also determine your political allegiance. How funny is that? Historian Joseph Addison took note of these positions when he observed two parties from the 1800s. Now one party had patches on the right side and the other had the opposite. It's pretty, pretty amazing. It's a pretty easy way to flip jerseys, right? The other team starts winning, you're like, you know what? Check it out, now I'm on this side, prove it. Number three, chimney sweep. Ah, terrible jobs, here we go. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house and I loved it, I thought it was cool. I thought it was like a little safety, like secret room. I don't know, it wasn't safe at all actually, it was just a dirty room. Had a little broom too, I always loved using that little broom. Little tiny sweeps, one at a time. Little tiny bag to go along with it, so gentle. This was a terrible job to have in Victorian London, obviously. Chimney sweeps were famously young as well. I can't say anything else there, but these guys were Young lads, history is horrible. Maybe that's why I was doing it, right? Because I could fit inside of the thing, that makes sense. 1840 was a good year, all things considered. A law was passed that made it illegal for anybody under the age of 21 to climb in and clean a chimney. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea, I could have used this great law and got out of the whole chore, shame. Number two, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day, who is he? How did he get away with it? And also, when are we gonna see a Netflix documentary on this guy? We have everybody else in this multiverse of killers. Where's this guy? We're gonna complete the image. Well, it's because we didn't find him. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily, and sadly, he would target sex workers at the time. He famously took the lives of five women from August to November of 1888, and they were believed to have been connected to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active until 1891. It's hard to tell who's who and who's doing what. Again, this is also so long ago. There's no cameras. Hard to catch someone. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victims as well, which is creepy. While there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was never identified, so. Yeah, that sucks, really. We gotta find him. Can't, but we gotta. And finally, number one, mudlarks. Yeah, we'll get dirty for this last one here. Why not? Victorian London around the 1840s, it was a bit of a mess. Everyone was sick, a lot of sore throats, to say the least. The jobs that were available, they sucked. They certainly didn't help you, you know, 
survive. The jobs that were available had you catching rats and crawling into sewers. One of the worst jobs to have was that of a mud lark. Now, as the name hints towards, a mud lark involved getting in deep in the mud and muck that would build up alongside the Thames River. Yeah, that dirty river back then. They're like, yeah, just go through the, the lining of that. See what's in there. Ugh. This one was reserved, again, for the younger folk with, you know, the, uh, the, the patellas that still worked, you know, digging in the mud, of course. Can't have an old guy in there. He's not gonna come back out. It was like working in quicksand. It was horrible. It was exhausting. Not to mention the chances of being whisked away by the river at any given moment. Yeah, it sucked. All for the slim chance of finding a pocket watch or some driftwood, rags, something, anything really worth your troubles. Well, I've been your host, Taylor McWaters. Thanks for watching this whole video. I know that's hard nowadays to watch an entire thing. I can't watch a movie or a video for the life of me, so thanks, that's great. Number 10 is the Pet Patrol. Do you guys remember the scene in Disney's Aladdin where he steals a piece of fruit and miraculously evades capture? Well, in real ancient Egypt, our prince wouldn't have stood a chance as police in Egypt used baboons to catch thieves. Incredibly intelligent, these animals were able to be trained, which paired with their speed and ability to jump to places that are difficult for humans to reach, made them the perfect crime fighters. Baboons could also easily remember the face of any thief as they are ranked third in the animal world for their memory. So don't go relying on any luck to get away with anything. Outside of their police duties, they were treated incredibly kindly, but trained to participate in picking fruit, making beer, and even dancing. Baboons were so beloved by Egyptians that some mummies were later found to have tattoos of baboons on their bodies. In ancient Egyptian mythology, baboons are best known for their association with Hoth, the god of wisdom. However, they were linked to many other gods as well. Definitely nothing like Babu in Aladdin. But wait, did I say tattoo? Well, being inked up is is no modern phenomena. Number nine is tatted up tuts. Egyptians join indigenous, Nordic, African, and many other cultures of having a history of tattooing. Now, Egyptian tattooing was bizarre just because it was exclusive to only women. By tattooing in public regions of the body, the tattoos were intended to permanently mark the woman's association with religious worship, or on the flip side, they could also be used to symbolize the lower class and the mark of a dancing girl or a that's what also makes it so bizarre. We can't really figure out why it was only women, what they meant, or what they symbolized beyond the vague generalization I just gave you. Tattooed mummies dating back to the 11th century dynasty have been found by archaeologists, some with religious symbolism, other with dots and swirls located on the lower chest, the abdominal, and the thighs. Some mummies were believed to have been tattooed with medical symbols, potentially to treat ailments. Although the meaning of ancient Egyptian tattoos may be unclear, it seems evident that that they had an array of implications and that women of many different social classes chose to wear them. Baddies. Speaking of things we can't understand, number eight in our countdown is my favorite pun yet. I put that shit on everything. Except quite literally. Egyptian doctors used human and animal excrement as a cure-all remedy for diseases and injuries. According to Eber's papyrus recording in 1500 BC, animal feces such as donkey, dog, gazelle, and fly were all celebrated for their healing properties and considered to ward off bad spirits. While we know that Egyptian medicine was incredibly advanced, even having doctors who were specialists, you can't help but question this logic. However, like with most things the Egyptians did, technically they weren't wrong. Research shows that microflora found in some types of animal dung contain antibiotic substances. So sure, you risk some tetanus, but you could also be cured. Lizard blood, dead mice, mud, moldy bread were also all used as topical ointments and dressings, and women were also sometimes dosed with horse saliva as a cure for low libido. And speaking of a woman's libido, man, did the Egyptians have some crazy women's healthcare going on. Number seven, we'll call the fertility games. I have a new found appreciation for modern medicine after learning a way our ancient Egyptian friends tested fertility was by placing a garlic or onion clove inside of a woman's. This is because ancient Egyptians believed that all orifices of a woman were connected, kind of like subway tunnels. Anyways, if the doctor could smell garlic on your breath the next morning, then the tubes were clear and the woman was fertile. But if the doctor couldn't smell garlic, then the tubes were blocked and it was assumed that the woman couldn't give birth. Once you are pregnant though, you can find out the sex of your baby in another bizarre tradition, popping a squat over some barley. Why? Because if it barely grew, then the baby was a boy. If the barley grew like crazy, then the baby was a girl. This test was believed to be highly accurate, and they weren't wrong in that. Turns out the test was actually accurate in 70% of all cases. And in 1963 lab testing, the urine of a pregnant woman did cause the seeds to sprout. Since she was in fact pregnant with a girl, it's likely the seeds start to grow faster due to elevated levels of estrogen, which stimulates growth. I can think of some 
truly hilarious ways to integrate this into a gender reveal party. But kids aren't for everyone, and that's okay. Ancient Egyptians were notoriously not fans of them, so let's talk number six, safe sex. There are actually lots of stories of Egyptian contraceptive methods, but don't get too fascinated because these aren't anything you want to try and recreate. Egyptian women would collect the dung of crocodiles or elephants to mix with sacred herbs and honey. They would then apply this paste mixture to their vulva and up inside the vagina as a protective seal on their genitals. Okay! Men, don't think you're getting much better though as your contraceptive was to rub onion juice all over your junk. If neither of these worked, which shocker if they didn't, the Egyptians had an herb called silphium, which was used to help devoid a woman of an unwanted pregnancy. They even knew what has been confirmed today that a chia gum from an achia tree worked as a spermicide and would reduce the likelihood of pregnancy after the fact. While it's impressive they figured out what they did, this whole section just has yeast infection written all over it, so let's just keep going for everybody's sake. Number 5. Animals on Trial Alright look, this one just doesn't make any sense. Zero sense. Law and Order. Besides being a great TV show, some would say it's the best thing we've ever come up with. Actual Law and Order, not the show. Thank goodness the system is perfect and never fails anyone ever. Well, they used to put animals on trial. I'm gonna say that again. They used to put animals on trial. Not sure how that works though. When cross-examining the witness, at what point do you call this BS? When you realize there's a barnyard animal on trial for a crime, or when the witness response is moo or oink. Like what you know? Like I don't know, it's it's just silly. Unless people in the dark ages could actually talk to animals, and we since lost that ability as people. Nah, I'm just kidding, that's just weird. Just don't do that. Don't don't put animals on trial, dude. Number four, consummation of the union. I know I couldn't. I just couldn't do it. This is a story just as old as time itself. You get married, Pope's happy, Dad's happy with it, Mom's happy, you got a blushing bride, what more do you need? That sounds great, right? Well, well, uh, things would be great, but you have to sign off on the marriage. Cross your T's, dot your I's, so to speak. Train going into the tunnel, the bedroom dance, the hanky panky. What bad marriages only do on birthdays and Hanukkah? Yeah, you know. Well, if that isn't depressing enough, how about having the family come and watch like they just subbed ye the OnlyFans? No, not just your family, but religious nobles, respectable people in your community. And they're going to watch you do the deed. They're there to make sure the marriage is complete. I just, do you, do you cheer on? I don't know, like, that's just so weird. Number three, pale skin. Ladies, beauty, and the industry. Look, there's a lot of things that can bring you up, bring you down. The makeup industry can be kind of tough to wrap your head around. It's, it's crazy, I know that. And there's been some crazy ideas out there throughout history. I think Medieval Times takes the cake though. You start with hair. All right, so we're going for the George Costanza look. Balding or receding hairline, beautiful. No eyebrows and no eyelashes, oh, even better. If this look wasn't enough for you, now you gotta make your skin pale. Like really pale. And the only sure way to do that, ladies, is bloodletting, which I hate talking about every time it comes up. I hate it, dude. Time to bleed for beauty, ladies, and as if that's not already done already. You let some blood go and you feel a little lightheaded, but now you're finally ready for the ball. Look, the hair thing, it doesn't matter. It doesn't define anything. Wear it how you want. Please don't hurt me, Will Smith. But the blood thing? I just, I can't recommend that to anyone. Don't don't lose your blood for to, to go pale. I, oh, that's a horrible feeling. Number two, Dracula's grave. Vampires, they're real. Sadly though, they're not as gorgeous as the ones seen on the big screen in TV. Well, at least the people in medieval Europe thought they were real. So real that they used to take extra measures to make sure they could sleep soundly at night. Don't want your precious life juice sucked out of your neck. Unless it's for beauty, because that's normal. Do you have a family member who always checks to see if the oven is turned off before you leave the house? Well, this is kind of like that, except it was burials and driving wooden stakes to the hearts of cadavers. Just in case, you know? A little vampire insurance, if you will. We went from being afraid of those who fear garlic to wanting to date them. How the tables have turned. Number one, night, knighthood. As cool as it may seem in the movies or games, I personally wouldn't want to be a part of it. Knights were warriors of a noble class who started learning and training at a very young age. Squires and knighthood. A militaristic education ain't the worst thing ever, sure, but it's, it's the war and fighting itself that scares me. This is brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat we're talking about here. Swords and shields, bows and arrows, horseback warfare. Nothing can fully prepare you for that. Personally, the armor is not an issue. Not moving around in it, it's actually more flexible than you might think. Seriously, look, it is, it's more flexible. It's the idea of trying to take off the armor after returning from battle and running around and slaying the enemy all day. 
Yeah. Chafing in metal cannot be fun, just saying. Kicking off our list at number 10, Afterlife Servant. Ancient Egyptians were closely connected to the afterlife, or at least they tried to be. After a loved one passed, ancient Egyptians would ensure that they have everything that they needed in the living world as well in the afterlife, right? Every valuable belonging, everything that you held dear to you your entire life, ideally, that's what you want to take to the other side, right? And that also included, sadly, lifelong servants. These masters were thinking about their necessities in the afterlife, and of course, being otherwise useless without their servant, they have to bring them to. Now, I know what you're thinking, right? That would probably suck for the other guy, right? Yeah, it did. It really did. Someone dies, now you gotta go too? You're like, what? Forced to be a literal ride or die. That is impossibly unfair. That's ancient Egypt for you. This tradition thankfully changed before many of these famous pharaohs that we know were put into power. So it didn't last forever, this horrible theme, this idea, but it did happen a lot. Famous pharaohs came into power and this tradition underwent a change, but eventually this practice led to the introduction of number nine. The Shabti. The Shabti were tiny carved figurines that would often be placed inside of these tombs of the pharaohs. Now you've probably seen them at some point and thought that they were just a valued belonging, which obviously they were, but their real purpose was much more grand. These beautiful little works of art were always shaped like mummies and on each and every Shabti carved into them were special instructions that determined what job they got in the afterlife. Yeah, it's like the world's oldest resume right there. Number eight, what's the buzz? Here we go, shout out to all the bees. Cleopatra was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and she had some bold ideas, you could say. So we're not exactly sure of its purpose, but we have some ideas, but there's a large amount of experts that have all agreed that Cleopatra, Greek Egyptian ruler of Egypt, she was known to sometimes fill a small box with a bunch of bees, and then shake that box around to disturb said bees, and voila, now we have a very weak massager. There's been some speculation as to why she created this bee box, and sure, you can use your imagination to some degree, probably, yes. This invention this scandalous idea, we're pretty sure it was inspired during her time ruling in Egypt, because, you know, all the bees. Also, to put a box of bees anywhere near your box of bees, you know what I mean? Bravo, that's brave. If she did what all these scholars think that she did with this vibrating box of bees, then double bravo. That's brave. I don't even go near one bee flying around, let alone a box of them. No, thank you. Number seven, shaved eyebrows. <gasps> ah, close one. I thought they were gone there for a second. Look, I love animals, okay? We all grew up with cats, dogs in our family, birds. We had a chameleon at one point. Point. That was interesting. But nobody mourned for their furry loved ones like ancient Egyptians. When the family cat died back then, not one, but every family member involved in the household, they would all shave off their eyebrows to mourn the cat's death. Cats were loved extra hard back then. Yeah, you think cats are spoiled today? When's the last time you saw your friend with their shaved eyebrows after their cat passed away? Yeah, didn't think so. God forbid, but if that fateful day shall arrive, commit. You know what I mean? Shave them off. Show them your love and shave them off. Number six, stitches. While surgery did exist, during ancient Egyptian times, common surgeries, invasive surgery wasn't quite as common because, well, one, no painkillers and antibiotics, and two, it's gonna hurt, and the list goes on and on, it's horrible. But one thing that's less invasive but still quite extremely important back then that was seen quite a bit during these times was the use of stitches. Yeah, probably need some at some point, building pyramids made of stones and rocks, you're gonna cut yourself. Ancient Egyptians found different and effective ways to make their own stitches in order to close these large wounds. They did so by using plant fibers, hair, so gross, tendons, even more gross, and even wool threads. Evidence in different mummified remains have been discovered. Yeah, imagine that, you cut your arm, you have to use someone else's tendon to stitch it up. No thanks, just leave it open, I'm all set. In the oldest known surgical text, which is referred to now as the Edwin Smith Papyrus, that came to ancient Egypt, there are 48 different cases of stitches being described, and they all sound like a great time. One example from the text of treating a laceration reads, quote, if thou findest that wound open and it's stitching loose, Thou shalt draw together for him the gash with two strips of linen. Basically says, hey, if you cut yourself, grab a shirt. Good luck. Don't move too quick. Number five, animal court. Oh, did you think the courtroom was a place only for members of the human species? <laughs> Au contraire. In fact, all kinds of members of the animal kingdom, from insects to dolphins, would stand trial if they were believed to be guilty of crimes. Some animals were executed. Some received strongly worded letters, and some were even proven not guilty. A rooster was once given the verdict of guilty for laying eggs. Truly the most unnatural of crimes. Pigs were usually the ones who got the most amount of court time, with one account even having a pig dressed in a waistcoat, gloves, pants, and a human mask to meet his end. I wonder if these animals were judged by a jury of their peers. Hmm. Number four, bloodletting. 
Look, we all know that a lot of men in their mid 40s treat their bodies like a rusted out Chevy Tahoe. I'm one of the same. Yeah, it needs a lot of work, but dad got an oil change, so that makes it all that makes it all better. This was common back in medieval times. A simple fix or a one fix fits all for every health issue was, of course, bloodletting. The old drain you of your precious life juice so you can get a detox, bro. Look, at first glance, yeah, it makes sense. If my Chevy runs a wee bit better after an oil change, then why not? It makes sense. Well, the truth is, there really isn't any new blood going in, so it's not so much as an oil change as it is so much just draining you of your energy, bro. Did it really work? Ah, not really. Arguably, it made things worse. This was also a treatment to make your skin pale, and uh, as my previous point with the ladies, that was also seen as beautiful, so remember that. Go to blood clinic. Please don't drain your blood to look prettier. Number three, Feast of Fools. Before the church took the fun of going overboard out of pretty much everything, every January 1st in France, the whole social hierarchy got topsy-turvy with the Feast of Fools. No, this was not a festival promoting fool-related cannibalism. Instead, the highest respected religious officials swapped with the lowest, and serving maids became masters with a king of misrule being crowned. The event was meant to display the biblical phrase, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, which is a creative excuse for parades, comic performances, costumes, cross-dressing, song, and naturally, way too much drinking. But like I said, thanks to the rowdy merrymaking and obscenities, the church was forced to ban it. Sad. Number two, funeral rites. Medieval times, people were dropping like flies. Just how things went. So, when it was time to deliver folks to their final resting place, some traditions were in order. For those that couldn't shake the Black Plague, they were put into big holes with the rest of the poor devils who couldn't also. Loved ones were taken care of with, well, great care and respect, and others, well, they had uh, modifications made to their graves. Like for instance, if you were suspected of being a vampire, well, you'd be buried with a giant boulder on top of you, just in case, you don't know. Maybe you decide to wake up and come back to town for a midnight snack, gotta be careful. Some were buried without heads, uh, the list goes on. All I can say is keep your garlic close, you wooden stakes, and, and, and just always wash your hands, especially when handling the recently deceased. That's, you gotta get... Number one. Duke it out. Couples in medieval Germany had an interesting way of figuring out their differences. Rather than just arguing like any normal couple, they took it to the octagon. Honestly, yeah, let's bring it back. Trial by single combat was a popular way to solve disagreements, and when man and wife were fighting, they had some great rules that had to be implemented. As one example, the husband had to stand in a hole with a hand behind his back while his wife got to run around with a sack filled with rocks. Seems a bit unfair, but hey, to each their own. I just imagine every time I have an argument with a girlfriend, and right in the middle of it, we just stop like, okay. I've had enough. We're settling this with our fisticuffs. Consult the marital duel rule book and have at thee, foul beast. Starting our list off at number 10, the first postage stamp. Uh, uh, uh. Nice, who's the first guy who licked the stamp? Why'd he do it, right? We'll start off with stamp facts. Why not? I know there's a couple pen pals out there that still use snail mail. That's cool, this one's for you. May 1st, 1840, the world's first ever postage stamp was sold, of course, for one penny. Pretty cheap, nice, we love it. The sale changed history. Now on the stamp was of course a portrait of one Queen Victoria, world's first ever profile photo for a letter. Here we go, they're like, oh, who's this? Who's this little person here? Of course this caught on, definitely caught on. More than 70 million letters were sent within the next year. And then that tripled only a few years later. And of course it thrived for 40 years. Do you still use letters? If so, write into us, write some fan mail. Forget the comments, write into us with a pen, with your autograph too, where you live. Yeah, no one's doing that anymore. Number nine, Alexander Graham Bell. I have no idea how phones work. I know it's vibrations and signals and I have to do this occasionally to help it out, but scientifically, nothing. I can't wrap my brain around this technology. Still, I'm 28 years old and I have YouTube, couldn't tell you. If I was sent back in time right now, I wouldn't beat Alexander Graham Bell. I would just watch him and wouldn't change history one bit. Guy's a wizard. On March 7th, 1876, Alexander Graham Bell received a patent on his invention the telephone, and just three days later, he made it work, somehow. The world's first phone call was of course to his assistant, Thomas Watson. Now I'm from the generation that had T9, and I thought that was bad. I also didn't have that, you know, one of these, we have to like, 
go around and around a bunch of times. T9 was way worse than anything. You have to Morse code message all your friends. Ugh, we have it too easy today. Never forget about Alexander Graham Bell. Hit that thumbs up on your smartphone for Alexander Graham Bell. How? How does it work? Hello? Number eight, Queen Victoria's death. You may have heard the phrase, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Sounds very Westeros, doesn't it? Sounds like the British Empire is in an alternate universe or something, I don't know. But this is meant in a literal sense. On January 22nd, 1901, the Victorian era came to a close, of course, after the death of Queen Victoria herself. She passed away at age 81, and Queen Victoria was succeeded by her oldest son, King Edward VII. Now, at this time, the British Empire literally took up more than one-fifth of all of Earth's land. So the sun actually did not set on the British Empire. It's a real phrase. It's not just a fun bit there. Number seven, Queen Victoria's eighth child. First of all, eighth? Kudos. Here's a fact that we don't talk about enough. Let's do this. First of all, I have no idea what it's like to give birth. I hear the comparisons and what it feels like, whatever, and it makes me want to faint. It's like peeing a watermelon or something like that. It's, I'm gonna faint just talking about it. The fact that you can endure this pain is beyond me. And the fact that you want to as well, Kudos. Now imagine being the queen and having the public, like everybody, talk smack about you and how you decide to give birth for the eighth time. Yeah, April 7th, 1853, Queen Victoria decided to use chloroform as an anesthetic delivery. Now everybody at this point that, you know, wasn't a scientist, they were sure to voice their opinions on the matter. It was a huge controversy, although this act directly spread the awareness of this medical advancement. I mean, yeah, it sounds, you know, they're like, yeah, don't do that. But can you do that? We don't really know. We're eating bread. Number six, grave bells. Oh, this one gives me chills. Here we go. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, and anything and everything was spreading. It was not an ideal time, wasn't very safe. Many were biting the bullet at this time, sadly, of course, being gravely ill. But with this came a dark trend, the safety coffin. Yeah. Just the backup coffin. These coffins, Lord forbid you are buried alive, these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again. Nice, like it's Michael Jackson's thriller. They would just come up and be like, oh, oh, oh guess who's back? Back in the Thames, here we go. All these coffins have extra comfort on the inside and a wire. This wire ran through the coffin and then attached to a bell on the outside, on the you know, ground floor. So if a passerby or heard it, well, thy would know something's up. Folks would get creative with their safety coffins. I mean, you know, they'd personalize it. Like for example, a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester. He passed in 1791, but instructed his family and watchmen to open this special door that would reveal a layer of glass. So that's real haunting to find. Hey, come look at grandpa. Yeah, he looks good, eh? Patent number 81,437. It was actually granted to Franz Vester in 1868, and it was an improved burial case. Just a glass case with someone who may or may not be alive inside. 50-50. It had an air inlet, a ladder, and of course, a bell. The description of the patent says, if too weak to ascend by the ladder, they can ring the bell, giving the desired alarm for help, and thus save themselves from premature death by being buried alive. So now I ask you, if you're walking in a graveyard and you heard a bell ringing, what, would you just start digging and be like, ah, I think I heard something. I don't know. Let's just disrupt this skeleton. Number five, how to ward off Draugr. Draugr, for those who didn't play Skyrim, are a Viking denomination of the undead. It's presumed as a certainty that when a person is buried in the ground, they will rise from the dead as a Draugr. From there, they'll attack people, and everyone will generally have a bad time until the Draugr is killed via decapitation, dismemberment, or any act of making it just not move anymore. To prevent this from happening in the first place, Viking land burials were done extremely carefully. Straw would be placed under the body and scissors would be laying on the chest, while their toes were sewn together and nails were pushed through their feet. They would then deconstruct a portion of the house and take take the corpse out through it, reconstructing it later, as Draugr were believed to follow the path back from their place of burial. They would then be entombed, and all of the items they'd owned that remained in their house would be turned upside down until their grave was magically sealed. Number 4. Berserkers 
A denomination of shamans, berserkers were warriors trained to fight and channel various spirits into their body. There were three schools of berserker, the wolf, boar, and bear, each one serving a slightly different role. To train, these berserkers were sent out into the wilderness to become more in tune with nature, and also drive themselves insane in the process. This would supposedly imbue them with the strengths of their respective school of combat, and so when they were called upon to enter into Norse conflicts, they were supposedly given the ability to transform into their respective animal, ripping the opposing warriors to shreds. This account is shared both by Vikings and the victims of Vikings, though it is more than likely that this is just an exaggeration meant to imply the bestial behavior of a berserker when in a trance. Number 3. The Blood Eagle. This one is not for the faint of heart. A ritualistic form of execution, the Blood Eagle is an extremely violent method of dispatching enemies which is described in the sagas. For a long period of time, these were thought to have been fictional, but as recent bodies have been unearthed that appear to have been victims of the Blood Eagle, there seems to be more truth to this than initially thought. The Blood Eagle involves the victim being laid on their front and a knife being used to separate their ribs from their spine. The spine is then removed and their lungs are spread out in the form of crimson wings, creating the eponymous Blood Eagle. Number 2. The Bloat the bloat was set as a ritual that would occur once every season at four set intervals in a year, but another could be organized if circumstances required it. The most well recorded bloat was one performed by Sigurd Hakonson. Detailed by Snorri Sturluson in the saga of Hakon the Good, this ritual involved a massive amount of human and animal sacrifices, as well as sacrifices of weaponry. Blood was also collected and splattered on the walls, altars, and participants. A feast would then be had, and toasts would be made, first to the gods, and then to the fallen. Number 1. Viking Chief Cremation Ceremonies We've all heard of Viking cremations, how they load their dead bro onto the ship and sail it out into the ocean, sending a flaming arrow into it so that they might be buried at sea. However, if it was a chief that died, things would get a little bit more screwed up and nasty. First off, one of the chief's girls would then volunteer, or be volunteered, to join the chief in the afterlife. She would then be made to get mad drunk, and then would be made to sleep with every single man in the village. Seriously. She would then be strangled, stabbed, and loaded onto the boat, and the whole fire thing would go down. What can I say, except... What? 